Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, December 12th. We will begin our meeting with a flag salute. If you'll please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now move to our consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the County Executive Department. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action, and the item may be moved for discussion. We do have two items that we're going to pull, item 20A and item 20G. Are there any other consent items that uh, need to be pulled for discussion from board members? I see none. Does anyone in the audience want to pull a consent item for discussion? Is there anyone online? All righty. Then uh, I'll ask uh, a motion to approve the remaining items. I will move approval. Okay. Motion by Supervisor Landon, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> I got too many agendas here. <laughs> okay, will the clerk please call the roll? Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll go to item 20A. Uh, who is going to present that? Nikki? Okay. <laughs> Something like that? Yes. What is it? Do ask for the mic. Yeah, it is. Okay, bye, Nikki. Bye. There we go. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Nikki Stregan, principal planner, and your housing manager with economic development. Uh, this item pertains to the Lease to Locals program, which is an East County program that offers cash incentives to property owners who convert short term rentals to long term rentals that house local workers. Um, and it asks, asks your board to take four actions. Um, the first is to approve amendments to the Lease to Locals guidelines. Those are attached in track changes and clean edits as attachments A and B of the staff report. These edits co cover a number of items, including new grant amounts. Those are lower compared to the pilot year for the program, uh, eligibility of multifamily homes up to four units, and they clarify some administrative efficiencies. Actions two, three, and four are in relation to changes to the Lease to Locals program <laughs> Uh, administration in the Economic Development Division. We're asking your board to add the authority of the CEO to sign program documents, and we're also asking your board to support cleanups related to the cost centers where those funds are uh, held. For action four, I'd like to call to your attention a correction that needs to be made pertaining to the correct budget amount from CEDRA's admin and fiscal support fund. Uh, a total budget amendment in the amount, in the amount of $500,000, not $703,100 is requested from CEDRA's fund. That remaining $203,100 to make up the total increased appropriations of $703,100 to Economic Developments Fund will be transferred from the Tahoe Economic and Community Enhancement Fund, which was already included in the fiscal year 23-24 budget. Uh, so action items one, two, three, and four are not changed, but I will read, I'm sorry, one, actions one, two, and three are not changed. Action four, I'll read into the record and is changed as follows. 
approve a fiscal year 23-24 budget amendment number AM-00916, decreasing appropriations from CC-06004, CEDRA Administration and Fiscal Support, in the amount of $500,000. Okay, uh, any uh, questions, comments from board members? Uh, Mr. Chair, I had a quick question. Yes. Um, Nikki, the funds that we're transferring um, from the economic development funds and then the CEDRA funds, uh, what's the source? Is CEDRA from the general fund then? CEDRA's source, the $500,000, was an ask that came to your board in July from TOT dollars. If so it is TOT dollars. That's what I wanted to make sure of. It's generated up there and it's being spent up there. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for board members? <clears throat> Mr. CEO, did you have a question? Oh, already. Yes. May I, may I just have Nikki quickly give us um, some stats? I, I oh. asked her yesterday, and I just think it's really important that we see that these dollars are actually getting people housed up in the North Lake Tahoe area. So, Nikki, maybe just sure. how many property owners, residents yes. it's serving? Sure, I have those. So 63 properties have been unlocked since the start of the program in 2022 and 121 workers, so that's a correction from when we chatted yesterday, 121 qualified workers have been housed through the program. Um, so those are a couple of quick stats. Sure. Thank you, Supervisor. <clears throat> All right, seeing uh, no. Okay, this, this has got me screwed up. Anyhow, <clears throat> seeing no more questions from board members, is there anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? <clears throat> is there anyone online? No, Chairman. All righty. Then I'll ask the board to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. And I'll second. With the corrections as noted in the record. And I will right. second that. <laughs> this will need a roll call. Yeah. Okay. Uh, motion by Supervisor Gustin, second by Supervisor Gore. Will the clerk please call the roll? Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 20G. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board. My name is Greg Bills. I'm a management analyst in your CEO office. Uh, the item before you is to approve a uh, proven extension for the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, PACE, uh, to December 31st of 2028. Uh, authorize the county executive or designee to execute a five-year administrative agreement extension with both for new financial Group LLC and Pace Funding Group LLC DBA Home Run Financing, and authorize the County Executive Officer or designee to execute a new Pace Administrative Agreement with the authorized Pace Administrator Administrators through December 31st of 2028, subject to County Council and Risk Management approval. Uh, since the Board action in December 2020, two State Pace Administrators have executed the Pace Administrative Agreement and currently authorized to provide Pace financing in unincorporated Plaster County. Renew Financial Group, LLC, and Home Run Financing. Uh, Renew Finance, Financial uh, Group began offering PACE financing in unincorporated Placer County on August 25th of 2021. Home Run Financing began offering PACE financing in unincorporated Placer County on August 16th of 2021. In the first year of the pilot program, Renew Financial and Home Run Financing uh, received very few applications due to delay in offer, offering the program. In 2022, the program began seeing applications slowly pick up. Um, on December 6, 2022, your board approved a one-year extension of the PACE pilot program administrative agreement through December 31st of 2023 due to the small scale of data available for adequate, adequate review. Since its in initial implementation of this program, both entities have completed a, a cumulative total of 19 PACE assessment in unincorporated Placer County. Uh, the PACE program provides additional financing options for county residents that desire renewable energy products. Staff is requesting a five-year extension of the PACE program through December 31st of 2028, after which staff will be back to your board um, uh, uh, to discuss the program options and data results available. Uh, this concludes my presentations, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none. 
Uh, is there anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? Uh, there is one online, Chairman. Okay. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Chelsea Olson, and I'm the Programs Director here at Renew Financial. I'd just like to uh, thank Mr. Bills for his work on bringing this item to you and say that we support the five-year extension. Thank you. All right. There's, there's one more, Chairman. Oh. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hello, this is Gabriel Holbert. I'm a Government Affairs Associate with Home Run Financing. Also want to give a thank you to Greg and county staff for their due diligence on this and state we're in support of the five-year extension. Thank you. Any more? No further, Chairman. All right. Seeing no further public comment, uh, I will entertain a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. This motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The item is moved. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> now is the time for public comment. Persons may address the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard when the 15 minute time limit is up, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular se session. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. Please come forward, anybody with public, from the public. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Taylor from North Auburn. I'm here to address concerns regarding the Placer County rezoning program. I've reviewed the options presented by the Planning Commission. I've done some math and fact checking. Uh, the Planning Commission is telling us that the shortfall in low-income and very low-income housing is 1,247 units or 62 acres. However, online, the RHNA tracker on the Placer County website says the shortfall is actually 1,107 units or 55 acres. This is a difference of 140 units or 7 acres. I'm going to assume 20 units per acre going forward. For simplicity, we'll just talk in acres. So option one is 160 acres. This is 105 more acres than the shortfall. <laughs> All of the properties in option one, they volunteered to be included. But option one does not take into account their scoring system. So it includes properties like Florence, which scored the lowest because it makes absolutely no sense for high density development. Option one they're saying is a 54% buffer. It's actually a 57% buffer. Let's keep in mind the state's recommending a buffer of 30% maximum. Why would we double the state's recommendation of a 57% buffer? We don't need to buffer a buffer. Moving on to option two, option two is 110 acres. This is 55 acres more than the shortfall. Option two, everybody volunteered and scored 80 or higher. We're being told that option two is only a 20% buffer. It's actually a 28% buffer. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend the last uh, Board of Supervisors meeting regarding this rezoning program, but I did watch the entire thing uh, online, and I heard a lot of opposition to the Florence properties, the Blitz Lane properties, and the Penryn properties. So if we toss out option one, because that's just way too exaggerated, and we circle back to option two, Florence Lane is not included in option two. If we take out Blitz Lane properties and the Penryn properties from option two, we're still left with 80 acres. Remember, the shortfall is only 55 acres. So even without Florence, Blitz Lane, and Penryn, you still have 25 acres more than you need. And you're left with an 11% buffer. Seems reasonable to me. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name's Leslie Davison, and I live on Florence Court. And I'm so grateful she has the numbers because that's not my forte at all. Um, I'm here to say 
living on Florence Court, my husband and I moved there two years ago because we wanted to live in a rural area. Most of us who live out there between 49 and Christian Valley and Meadow Vista, we live out there because we wanted a rural area. We didn't want to live in a high density area. We, most of us have scrimped and saved our lives to live in that kind of an area. If you put that high density housing there on Florence Court, you are going to most likely, and here's a number, but increase the population by probably 400 people dropping into a rural area. You're going to increase the amount of traffic on 49. You're going to increase the traffic through Christian Valley to get onto 80 because a lot of people don't want to go down 49. They go through um, to get onto Dry Creek and onto 80 that way. So you're going to be have people traveling through all this rural area to get onto 80. I don't think these people want traffic. They live there because they like the rural area. Um, my understanding, Mr. Holmes, is that you wanted to to eliminate Florence Court or at least consider that, which I really appreciate. Um, my question earlier to Ms. Gustafson, am I saying your name right? Um, that um, the planning director did not want to eliminate that site. And I guess my question was, <clears throat> oh, well. Go ahead. You, oh, okay. Go ahead and wrap up. My question was, do you have a vote over the planning commissioner to say, you know what, we don't want Florence Court, we don't want Blitz, we don't want Penryn. You know, everybody has, I, I think, um, a, a good rationale for not wanting high density housing in these areas for many, many reasons that we really can't get into here. So I hope that between now and our next meeting, you all discuss this and consider removing Florence Court, and if I could speak for Penryn and Blitz, Blitz as well, for the, um, the same reason. And I'm very grateful Taylor had the numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Mr. Holmes? I'm nice fine, to see thank you, you, sir. Um, I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Penny Cooey. I am the owner of Long Run Ranch. We're located in Newcastle, California on Gold Hill Road. I am a rancher, a mom, a grandmother. It's emotional for me. It's extremely difficult to move to a rural area and have all your hopes and dreams planted on your land and then be told that it's going to change. We invested all our money, our heart and soul into our land and the neighborhoods that we lived in. We picked them because we're ranchers and we're farmers. We have the right to farm, we have the right to ranch. And now all of a sudden, you have this landscape up here. Just imagine how this is gonna change. You're gonna put condos and apartment buildings in rural neighborhoods. I find it very ironic that this picture would be up today. Um, let me read you briefly something that I wrote and I posted on Facebook um, regarding all this. Many of us who have purchased homes in rural Placer County have purchased them due to the rural aspect. We are ranchers, farmers, stewards of the land. Rezoning means our country life that we bought and paid for is now being encroached upon with towering buildings, noise, cars, crowded streets. This is not what we bought. This is not what we invested in. If we wanted to live in town, we would. So regardless how well designed these structures will be, it changes the landscape for those of us seeking a rural lifestyle, being able to farm and ranch. Perhaps better fitted would be build these in residential neighborhoods where there are empty lots, old homes, unoccupied that would be purchased and buildings put in. We have the right to farm, and with farming comes certain noises, smells, vehicles, machines, etc. How do you think an apartment building will handle the harvesting of cattle? the giant fans used to keep the orchard from freezing, the roosters crowing at 4 a.m. and the occasional shotgun, the livestock guardian dogs protecting their flocks at all hours of the night. Something for people to think about when they are plotting a move that will drastically affect your neighborhoods who are stewards of the land, the very people you buy fruits, vegetables, and meat from at the farmer's market in Auburn on Saturday mornings. 
I will remind all of you, no farm, no food. And I really hope these changes can be made. I just drove by DeWitt. There's acres and acres and acres of land in DeWitt that's empty with old buildings that cannot be used. Perhaps that's a better place to put these apartment buildings. There's many choices that can be made. As farmers and ranchers cannot continue to absorb the problems of government, this county was formed and was known for its agriculture, and we are slowly being pushed out. And I don't think it's right, and I don't think it's the kind of reputation this county wants to have. We have so much crime going on right now in Auburn, I can't even bring my grandchildren to town at night anymore. I won't do it because I don't want to get in a fight with somebody that's intending to harm us. So maybe we should think about what's going on. I'm glad Taylor had numbers. I'm not a number girl. I'm a passion girl. I left my livestock this morning to come here and speak because I was homeless. I'm a recovered addict and alcoholic. I have worked my tail off to own my five and a half acres in Newcastle, California. I've already been impacted by some of the things that be rezoned down there. Yeah, this isn't affecting my neighborhood. It affects every rancher and farmer and anyone who wants to live in a rural environment. And I really hope that you consider consider making some different choices. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience under public comment? <clears throat> Already, is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, um, Chairman Holmes and board members. This is Patty Neifer. Hi, Patty. I'm in Pen Penryn. Hi there. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today. I would love to be there in person. I think what's being said here is extremely important and thank you for allowing public comment on the rezoning housing decisions. My opinion is that the high density rezoning decisions you're making in the next few months will change the face of small rural communities. Penny said that so beautifully. Um, farming and ranching is is an integral part of Placer County and it hasn't been taken into consideration. I really want to thank each of you for the many questions you had at the November 27th board meeting. It's obvious that you have some concerns as well. Um, you gave the planning director a new direction to look at some additional parcels to take a look at how the parcels that are selected um, are impacting the community. And I think that's a really good direction. Um, it may not be your intent, um, but taking action to meet the mandates for state affordable housing is going to collapse the rural community of Penryn by mandating an unsustainable population. Penryn has around 900 total residents, just one single planned complex, the housing placer uh, trust apartments for extremely low renters will add over a thousand people to Penryn. That doubles the number of people requiring services. It'll overwhelm the Penryn School, the Penryn Fire Department, and other public services. And there are quite a few letters on file already um, that and concerns by the school district, by the fire district, um, by lots of residents that have been attending the MAC meetings. Um, there are also eight additional proposed rezoned high density parcels in Penryn. And I think some fundamental errors were made in how these parcels were selected throughout all of Placer County. Some big mistakes. And instead of rushing forward and choosing only from those that have been selected, I think opening things back up again, I know the time is very tight, but opening things back up again and looking at some more appropriate locations is really the only way to, do, to go. What solutions are being proposed in other counties in unincorporated rural areas? Um, we all have the same issues. I mean, the, some research needs to be done. And can you guarantee that your direction to the planning to explore other options and additional parcels instead of clustering all of the low income housing in the rural communities of Penryn, Loomis, North Auburn, Granite Bay, how can you guarantee that there will be other parcels explored? Please review the detailed letters of concern 
take into consideration the record high attendance at the MAC meetings, the concerns of rural residents about this major change in the culture of our neighborhoods. And I urge you, please don't approve any of the three currently proposed rezoning plans until other options have been explored. And I have faith in you and your, your planners that there are better options. Time just needs to be devoted to find those. Please take more time, do your research and find a better way because this decision cannot be undone. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. <clears throat> Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, good morning. My name is Jennifer Rogers, and I first would like to echo all of the prior comments that have come before me. I support each and every one. Um, I'm here today to respectfully request that the Board of Supervisors remove sites 19, 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28, which I will here and after refer to as the sites, from the rezoning plan. I supplement my prior delivered letters with these additional marks and ask that all my letters and comments here apply to the sites. The notice of preparation of an ERR that was issued on 1020 acknowledges that although the project includes 74 properties, the final list will include fewer. Despite that acknowledgement, the county has decided to conduct EIR reports for each of the proposed locations. I submit this is an irresponsible use of county monies. Between the information included in the notice, a site visit, a review of a few maps, and a reasonable and rational decision maker, which I argue each of you are, it is undisputed that the sites in question are not appropriate for high density affordable housing. First, consider fire protection. Each of the sites are in a local responsibility area for fire protection. This means that the cost of fire protection services will fall solely on the county. However, there are at least 21 sites that have not had time to do a full analysis that are in state, responsibil state responsibility areas for fire protection, which means that the cost of fire protection will be borne by the state. Given our recent history with wildfires and their destruction, this should be a high consideration to the board. Second, traffic. To be meaningful and accurate, any traffic study for the sites in question should be done over a 12 month period. The Auburn Folsom Douglas intersection is the gateway for public access to Folsom Lake to launch boats, camp, etc. A traffic study needs to include not only the summer traffic at this location, but also the impact that the expansion of the Rayleigh Shopping Center will have on the traffic in the area. It also bears repeating on every pl public platform that Jessica's law, which mandated that sex offenders had to be at least 2,000 feet away from any school, or place where children congregated was held unconstitutional in 2015. The Supreme Court of California held that each determination with respect to where a sex offender lives needed to be done on a case by case basis. Many people erroneously believe that there are laws that protect our children in this respect and there are not. That is why we need your support on this endeavor and to not have high density apartment living next to our, our children's schools. In closing, an environmental impact report is not needed for the sites in question when a rational and reasonable decision maker can clearly see that the cons outweigh the pros in this scenario. Save the EIR for the close calls. I submit that sites 19, 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28 are not close calls. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning. I'm Pam Asai, and I live on Rock Springs Road in Penryn. Um, and um, thank you for um, hearing my share. Um, I support each of the speakers who have uh, presented so far. Um, I think their eloquence and their preparation speaks to their devotion and passion against the um, these um, developments. Each site has inappropriate um, qualities. Uh, it's unbelievable to me that some of these properties have even been submitted for consideration. Um, in particular, the area behind the Valencia Club in Penryn is 
completely inappropriate for any kind of residence um, between Fridays and Sundays and uh, uh, Fridays and Mondays on holiday weekends. Um, it's It would be uninhabitable. Uh, people wouldn't be able to get to sleep until two in the morning um, at the earliest. Um, the fellow there is trying to sell that property, and that's probably why it got put on your list is because it is um, underutilized for that very reason. No one's going to buy a house there. I, I can't believe it was even put on there. And I, I think that's, this is an example of each of the other spaces that have been presented to you. It's just not, it's just completely irrational. I, I am not as prepared as the other speakers, but I can tell you that um, it's the amount of information uh, about the inappropriateness of these properties is vol is uh, you could write volumes about it. So I don't know why you even hired this person to give you these suggestions because she clearly d is not familiar with the areas. So. Um, Gosh, at the risk of being even more inflammatory, I'll calm down a bit and tell you a little bit about my history. I too was homeless. I too was uh, one of the uh, the drags on society. Thank goodness I live in a community and in a country that was able to you know, have a safety net for me and somebody was able to reach me and show me a different way so that I too could start seeing that I needed to be responsible for myself. And I too could have my dreams come true. The dream to be in a serene area, the dream to live with people who are decent and kind and uh, raise animals. And, uh, and so I saved my money and I worked my ass off too, you know? And it's just unbearable to think that this could be destroyed. This area is rich with history. Please, please don't destroy it. Um, I'll stop and next time I'll be better prepared. I thank you again. I'm learning how to do this. And, and it's probably a good thing that these, um, these properties have been proposed for development because it has motivated me to learn to become involved with this um, with, with my government. So um, next time I'll do better, but please know that my um, comments are sincere and I really appreciate what you guys do. I can't imagine doing your job. I really appreciate you. Please do not betray us. Please maintain some semblance of rural America and please use the DeWitt Center. I thought that was a wonderful point. Like why are you not looking at, at areas where there are resources to get people back on their feet instead of dumping them in rural areas, you know, where kids are going to be kids and they're going to need to explore and discover and grow and they're going to be lost. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Is <clears throat> anyone else on? Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, uh, Supervisors, Cheryl Burkema, Granite Bay. Um, I'd like to raise the um, the topic of infrastructure um, and how we got here today. We're here in the holiday season. The worst projects are always presented during the holiday season, uh, hoping, I guess, that people are too busy and occupied to focus on such important um, events in our in our history. I'd like to mention Sunset Area Plan was presented and uh, Supervisors Gore, Holmes, Gustafson, and ex-supervisors Wagant and Euler approved that plan. That plan had a proposal from the Alliance for Environmental Leadership, which had far more numbers for low-income housing. Um, this was the largest plan in Placer's history. Placer residents put significant money into infrastructure um, to support this plan. And the reality is that a half a dozen special interest wealthy developers are the beneficiaries. Shanty Landon's District 2 has two acres proposed. 
two. That doesn't seem very fair compared to the 50 something acres in areas that don't have infrastructure. Um, so I would ask you to again to look at your infrastructure spending and how independent decisions to spend money on infrastructure have benefited wealthy individuals. Um, the specific plans should be included in this. They come monthly with changes. Um, the, Director Pahuli said that he, um, uh, EIRs, this is like a time bound exercise. We've known about this in 2017, you knew what the numbers were. You approved Sunset Area Plan and you had time to do EIRs. You've had years since the um, housing element was first drafted and these properties were picked. We don't even have a housing manager now. What does that say? We have someone that'll come up and implement a single program. We've let this person go off and produce 40 programs and now they're being just ad hoc implemented. Um, for North Auburn, the infrastructure was put in and a, a plan is being produced at the same time, these independent events are being done instead of having a single plan that said, this is how we're going to uh, approach low low, uh, high density and low density in Placer County. That never happened. We have Bonnie Gore spending green means go money um, for sewer and infrastructure, and not and people don't even know that this is happening. There's a North Auburn community plan. People don't know that's happening. It's like someone is behind the scenes orchestrating all the infrastructure and where the low density will go. In District 2, it is medium density, above moderate income. That says it all, really. We're now taking who actually asked why it would make sense to put low density in one area where all the funding is and to put high density where there isn't infrastructure or services. I implore you to go back and look at this um, plan as Patty Neifer said and say, why are we even doing this? This is like an exercise that was put forward by a planner that is no longer even responsible for the implementation of this program. In terms of transparency, I have an issue with the letters not being posted. Um, also, the developer bonus, some of these numbers, like in Penryn, the, the developers can go back and get additional 50%. So the numbers that you're presenting are going to be even much higher than they are already. Um, Thank you, Cheryl. If you could wrap up, please, we'd appreciate it. Yes, I'd really appreciate if you would go back and look at what are the options, put a moratorium on developer and specific plan building. They should not be able to come back and keep doing what they do, making decisions to get changes that benefit the wealthy and not the community residents. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments, please. Robert, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Robert? Caller, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm not sure if you're, if it's an echo or not, but um, I'll go ahead and try to give you my comments. All right. So I'm requesting that Placer County supervisors amend Placer County Code 6.08.010 to add the same language as 12.24.020 items I.1 and I.3. And those two codes specifically are for, uh, for public recreation areas. The first one is just that dogs must be on a leash no longer than six feet at all times. And the second one is for dog owners to pick up their dog feces. That basically says dog feces must be cleaned up and properly disposed of into trash receptacles. So we currently have those two on the books, but we don't have a law 
in just the general public area. So I'm asking these two code elements to be added to 6.08.010. And the reason is because I, I live in Placer County and we have dog poop all over our neighborhood. We pick it up, we have dogs, but we pick up our dog poop and some of our neighbors, very, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say names or anything, but some don't pick it up. And the US EPA has uh, categorized dog waste as uh, in the same category as oil, grease, toxic chemicals, herbicides, insecticides. Dog waste is very toxic. In fact, it's 23 times more toxic than human waste. Dog feces contain numerous pathogens, including multi-drug resistant uh, bacteria such as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus. Those are two very serious bacteria uh, that, that can get into human beings and cause serious illness and death. Uh, Giardia cysts and numerous other pathogens. Many of these pathogens are resistant to antibiotics. So while I love dogs, I don't love their dog poop. I'm just asking the supervisors to simply amend current code and just add that language to um, from 12.24.020. Thank you, sir. This, we need your name for the record, to... please. Yeah, what did you say? I need your name for the record, please. Oh. Robert Maurice, M O W R I S. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do I have any more time or do any more time to just make one more comment? Thank you. All right. Uh, is there any other? There is, Chairman. I'm going to allow another 50, uh, five minutes for public comment because we do have to move on. So uh, if we cannot finish public comment after uh, this lady speaks, uh, we will take take care take it up after the board after the end of the board board meeting. <clears throat> Caller, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I spoke at the last meeting regarding these high density areas. I'm the current chair for Christian Valley Park Community uh, Services District. And I just want to um, echo everybody's sentiment about disrupting and completely turning uh, Auburn into an eventual, you know, LA basin. But I'm going to just say right here, right now, every board member supports what I'm about to say. Christian Valley is at all completely against any annexation that would require us providing potable water to the Florence. Um, proposed site, site 58. So unless somebody wants to come to our board and talk to us about the infrastructure, I vehemently am opposed to keeping that Florence site on the plan map. The planners did not reach out to us, did not talk to us at all. And there's just absolutely no infrastructure to support where these high densities are going. Furthermore, who actually is going to get to rent these units? The flood of aliens coming across the border because this country seems to want to give them all the money to be there. Or is there, are we going to lift people up off the street that are actual native born Californians? I really would like the board to uh, roll it back and not let Sacramento bully you. Special districts are de jure to California. They were carved out. They're not corporate, they're unincorporated. So we're talking person, different kinds of persons, legal persons. But the infrastructure has to be uh, in a part of the equation. I, as a taxpayer, do not wanna pay for what the developers are not gonna be forced to pay for. And that's what's gonna happen. And we also do roads. So we have water as enterprise and we take care of our roads. But there's nothing packed into this that is gonna take care of all the infrastructure, not to mention who is actually gonna to get to inhabit these high density areas. That's my concern. 
And I appreciate the board what they do because I'm on a board myself and it's not an easy job, but really it's time to push back and not be railroaded. I appreciate your time and I yield. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now close public comment. If there's any commenters that want to address the board after at the end of our board meeting, I'll be welcome. They'll be welcome to uh, present. Thank you. <clears throat> now we will move. What am I doing now? Am I doing the board okay. reports? Huh? Board reports. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to go to board member and county executive reports. Any board member reports? Supervisor Gore. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just one item I wanted to let you all know that uh, we invited Assemblyman Joe Patterson out to the mobile temporary shelter this morning. He and one of his staff members came out and met with um, the gathering in and some of our HHS folks just to share with him the work that's being done at the mobile temporary shelter. And um, I don't believe he's attended or gone to the congregate shelter. So we'll have oh, he went there as well. I see Mr. Diederich in the office. We had a chance to actually visit both of the sites. We really appreciate him taking the time to learn a little bit more about how we're addressing the homelessness issue here in Plaster County. Thank you, Supervisor. Any other supervisor reports? Uh, Cindy, Supervisor Thank you. Gustafson. Thank you. Um, last week, uh, Thursday and Friday, I attended the Sierra Nevada Conservancy Board meeting um, representing uh, all of the counties in the central region. And uh, we heard a report on the state budget issues. Um, and I just wanted to share what I've learned. Most importantly is how we term the $68 billion deficit is not a deficit. It's a revenue shortfall. <laughs> so please use that in any comments you might make. And that uh, this morning I was educated that we won't be looking at budget cuts at the state, budget solutions. Um, but of course, as we look at uh, where those solutions may come from, we don't want them to fall on our county uh, coffers and uh, the responsibility areas we have. I wanted to share that. Um, the Conservancy continues to remain very optimistic about um, the forest fuels uh, projects. They received $72 million worth of request for a pot of about $35 million uh, that was allocated to them. And uh, so we see the need is extreme, and we hope that they're successful in continuing to garner some state support to continue the great programs to protect our communities throughout the Sierra. So um, that was it for that. And then uh, one other note I thought, given uh, I heard um, grave concern from the public on this last item. I did want to thank our county staff. Um, many of them are in the audience today. This has been a heck of a year, um, and it is the holiday season, and I just want to thank uh, our community, uh, our staff, our community public service workers in our county staff that do such an excellent job. They don't always have the most popular job, nor do we. Um, but they work very diligently uh, on behalf of all of our community members with um, the utmost of respect to community members. And I so appreciate that from all of you. And so I just wanted to wish you a happy holiday and thank you for your service. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, seeing no, no more board member reports, does the county executive officer have a report? No report. All right, thank you. So I'm going to go to 10. Oh, okay, there we go. Now we're going to the 920 timed item on the supplemental agenda. This is a commendation for the Placer Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Board uh, to the Animals. Uh, I will be presenting this to. Is there someone here from SPCA? Oh, you want to come forward now? <clears throat> Hello there. Hi there. Let me read this into the record, then we'll have the board approve it, and then you can make any comments that you wish. Okay. <clears throat> this is in a matter of a commendation, recognize, <clears throat> recognizing, <clears throat> excuse me. 
<clears throat> recognizing the Placer Society for the Prevention of Cruelties to Animals, Placer SPCA, for 50 years of animal welfare services to Placer County communities. <clears throat> Whereas the Placer Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was founded in 1973 and is celebrating their 50th anniversary of playing an active and compassionate role in serving the animals and their owners in the community. And whereas the Placer SPCA, the largest and most comprehensive nonprofit animal welfare and shirt sheltering organization in Placer County, and whereas in the early years, the Placer SPCA operated without a shelter of its own and was run entirely by volunteers who found foster homes for animals. And whereas in 1995, the first shelter was completed. Whereas in 2018, the Placer SPCA constructed a 21,000 square foot best in animal welfare practices, adoption and education center, which provides a home-like setting for promoting an animal's adoptability. And whereas the County of Placer acknowledges the long-standing relationship with the Placer SPCA and considers the nonprofit organization a valued and appreciated partner working for many years, providing services to the community. <clears throat> and whereas the Placer SPCA continues to provide services for the pets and people of the community through low-cost spray and neuter services, pet food assistance for families in need, medical care for animals, low-cost vaccination, and microchipping for pets. And whereas the Placer SPCA continues to offer programs aimed at, aimed at keeping people and their pets together through the SOS program and behavioral training. And whereas the County of Placer is appreciative of the professional caring individuals who work and volunteer in concert with the Placer SPCA Board of Directors. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> now, therefore, let it be known that the above commendation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting on Tuesday, December 12th, recognizing the Placer SPCA for 50 years of outstanding service and dedication in their mission of enhancing the lives of companion animals and supporting the human animal bond. And at that point, I will ask a uh, motion to approve this. <coughs> Is there someone that likes I'd to be happy to move approval. Um, and if I, well, I'll let somebody second and then yeah. if I may make a comment. I'll second. Okay, motion by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstention, the item is moved. So now if any board members wish to make any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> um, I just um, want to say how much I appreciate the work of the SPCA at the opportunity last night. And I know that Supervisor Landon attended as well the open house, the annual open house um, of the facility. It's the 50th um, anniversary of the SPCA. And the parking lot was full. The place was packed. Um, and really, the, and the location is beautiful. Um, now, I have to admit that I was on the city council when we allocated millions of dollars to help with the funding, but really, it, it's not a government entity. It is a partnership with our local community members, businesses, nonprofits, and the SPCA does just a tremendous job and really appreciate um, the work that you continue to do. And, and like I said, it's not just... it's not just government, right? But it's so many volunteers and so many people giving back to support your efforts. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, any other comments from board members? <clears throat> I just have one. Um, several years ago, uh, Lilani, is that her name? Lilani, yes. Uh, spoke to a group of us and <clears throat> she explained the difference between the SPCA and Placer County Animal Services. So Placer County Animal Services is to protect people from animals. And the SPC's job is to protect animals from people. And so I always remember that. So I, I value the services that you have provided over these 50 years. So congratulations. And now we'll come. Oh, did you want to make some comments? I just would like to say thank you so very much for the rec recognition. It means so much to us, especially this, um, our 50th year. 
celebration, and thank you so much for attending our holiday open house last night. We were hoping for a record-breaking attendance, and I think we saw that last night. Um, the support from the community, we're, we're so pleased to serve all of Placer County, and just thank you so very much for the recognition and all of your support. It means a lot to us. Thank you. I'll bring this down and uh, welcome any board members who want to join me. You're, you're, we're gonna. Yeah. We will hold this together. Yeah, I've got a boot on my foot. Come this way. Bring it down your neck. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. We will now move to our 9.30 timed item. This is from the Sheriff's Office. This Community Forum 2022 Immigration and Customs Enforcement Access Information Report, presented by Captain Resendez. Yes, good morning, Chairman Holmes, members of the board, Mr. Chadney, Ms. Schwab. <clears throat> I'm Nelson Resendez, a captain with the Placer County Sheriff's Office. Uh, this presentation is going to be short due to the fact that the Sheriff's Office, specifically Corrections, continues to be minimally impacted by SB 54 as compared to other counties in California. As you know, Senate Bill 54 became law on January 1st, 2018. The Placer County Sheriff's Office has policies in place that are in line with SB 54, and we comply with that state law. The Truth Act requires the Sheriff's Office hold a community forum and present data pertaining to ICE holds, notification, or transfer requests from previous year. We provide information regarding a person's release date and respond to requests by ICE for notification prior to release. But only if that information is available to the public on our website or the inmate has a qualifying conviction specified in Government Code Section 7282.5. We do not provide work or home information in accordance with the law. Thus, in 2022, we received 101 requests from ICE requesting notification of release or transfer. Of those 101 requests, we gave advance release notice on 21 individuals who had qualifying convictions. We do not hold an inmate for ICE transfers unless authorized by a federal arrest warrant and none were received in 2022. We had no requests from ICE to interview any individuals being held in our jails. Those are the numbers I have for the following year, and that concludes my presentation. I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. <laughs> thank you, Captain Resendez. Uh, any comments, questions from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience who wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? All righty. This is just a... Uh, Report, there's no action taken. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much, Captain. We'll now move to our 9.40 a.m. County Executive, Placer County 2024 Legislative Advocacy, presented by Joel Joyce. It's Karen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning, Chair, members of your board, Daniel Karen, Joel Joyce with the County Executive Office. I'm here today to provort, uh, present a legislative update from 2023, as well as some draft changes before your board for the 2024 platform. Additionally, I'm joined today by our state lobbyist, Karen Lang from Shaw, Yoder, Schmelzer and Lang, and then from our DC lobbyist, Michael Galano from the firm Holland and Knight. So quickly through the presentation, I'll give a brief federal and state update before turning it over to Karen and Michael Galano for a more in-depth update on the state and federal uh, process. Um, I will then go into the legislative platform changes before your board for 2024, and then discuss some key, key dates as we get into the winter and spring of 2024. So really quick on the federal side, uh, the federal appropriations process for the current federal, or the current federal fiscal year is still ongoing. Uh, both the House and Senate have not yet passed um, an, a, one of the 12 appropriations bills. Within a few of those appropriations bills, the county still has projects outstanding for funding. One is $1 million for the Placer County Sheriff's Office radios uh, through Congressman Kiley's office, and then an additional $1.5 million for the Forest Hill Defied Wildfire Defense Project, formerly known as Baker Ranch, and that was through Senator Padilla's office. Uh, one unique thing for California, as I'm sure as everyone is aware, we do have a new senator um, after the passing of, our, of Senator Dianne Feinstein, LaFonza Butler. Uh, she has announced she is not running for election, so she'll just be a caretaker until um, the election in 2024. One of the uh, big pieces of legislation that was due to be reauthorized in 2023 was the Farm Bill. Um, it did expire at the end of September. There was a one-year authorization uh, to extend that expiration to September, 20th, uh, September 30th, 2024. Um, and that's important because we do try to get a lot of our regional forest health priorities within the Farm Bill as a, way to, as a vehicle to move those priorities. And then one of our bigger pieces of legislation that we've been advocating for is the Lake Tahoe Restoration Act reauthorization extension. Uh, there's about $250, $300 million that has been authorized uh, through the previous extension of the LTRA that has yet to be utilized. And so that is, that is a key, key piece of legislation that we are advocating on. On the state side, really brief here, uh, for the board's awareness, uh, as term limits start kicking in, we did see about a 25% turnover uh, through our state legislators, and that's going to be important as we go through some of our challenges on the next slide. Additionally, there are over 3,000 bills that were introduced this year. Um, it's, it's quite a large number. Um, it's a large number for staff, and I want to commend um, all of Placer County. Um, this is, it's not an easy task to go through this number of legis legislative items um, and the requests I have to send to staff for information, et cetera. So I, I really want to do commend, commend staff on this. And then 1,100 of those 3,000 have been enacted. Uh, the remaining, there were about 150 vetoes, but the remaining bills uh, still, for the most part, remain alive for the second year of the session. Um, Placer County acted, uh, took an official position on over 30 pieces of legislation. We were probably involved in over 100 um, other pieces of legislation, various meetings, et cetera. And then uh, Karen will go into kind of our, our wins and losses uh, that we've had uh, this past year on the state side. Um, I do want to highlight for the board's knowledge some challenges uh, that we faced 2023 and years past and, and then moving forward. Um, and it really defines and, and defines my work as, as we try to take positions on legislation and advocate uh, for the board's priorities. So first is political division. This is mostly focused on the federal side, as, as people know. Um, yes, there's a Republican, there's a Democrat and, and issue, but you're really starting to see a lack of trust, even on the intra-party side, which is making compromise uh, really difficult on the federal uh, side of things. And that's why you see a, a lack of legislation being passed. I think there were 12 or 13 bills signed into the law uh, this year on the federal side. Um, election year, it complicates everything, especially in a presidential election year. Uh, there's a lot of what I call messaging bills, messaging pieces of legislation that, that get introduced. Part of my work is I still have to take those seriously. Uh, you just never know. And so it's really difficult to understand uh, where legislators want to go with certain pieces of legislation. Um, so that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, and we'll go into the, the third bullet here. Uh, Supervisor Gustafson had mentioned this earlier. 
the state budget, uh, when these slides were put together, as well as the staff report, uh, the LAO's fiscal outlook had yet to be released. Um, obviously, everyone's heard there's a $68 billion uh, revenue shortfall. I will say it's a deficit. <laughs> um, it's over three fiscal years, which is, which is very unique, and, and Karen will go into that. Um, and back to my previous point on the 25% new legislators. This is with the size of the challenge before the state, with the amount of new members, uh, not only the 25% that are new, but even that those that joined after the recession in 2008, 2010 period, um, these legislatures just, there's a lack of experience in understanding how to handle this size of a budget problem. Um, and so I think you're gonna see that, uh, especially um, as one party continues to dominate the state legislature and the inter-party dynamics and that, uh, that's gonna probably play out more in public um, than in, in previous uh, budget issue years, such as the Great Recession and some years before that. Um, so we'll go into more detail on, on the state budget during Karen's presentation. Another challenge that's facing not only Placer County, but uh, it's occurring more and more is a one, sits, one size fits all approach, especially at the state level. Tahoe area experiences this quite a bit uh, with state law, but it's now, just, it's now occurring almost in every jurisdiction. It's not just a rural versus urban thing. It's sometimes within ge various geographies or within certain communities. Um, propositions now, I'll, I'll use minimum wage as an example, um, not the 15, but there, there's a push to have an $18 minimum wage. That may work for San Francisco. It's, it may not work for Lassen. And so not only do you see that on the legislative side of things, but also in the state propositions. The next bullet on here is the Placer County reputation. Good or bad? Um, the reputation of this county at the state level, I would say, is a good thing, but it, it's, people look at Placer County and, and Tahoe as well as an affluent community, a community that doesn't need a lot of help, per se, um, which is not true. We still have communities uh, that need assistance. It, this reputation is really a challenge when we go after funding uh, for some of our communities and some of our neighborhoods. Um, and so it's, it's one thing we have to work through. And, and yes, this board and, and previous boards have, have governed this county well in based from a fiscal approach as well from a policy approach. But there are still needs uh, that we do need help from, both at the state and federal level. And we have to, I have to, and staff has to work through the process of really telling the story uh, more so than, than other jurisdictions. And then a unique, uh, unique bullet on this list is the last, is artificial intelligence. Uh, it's new to me, it's new to a lot of people. Um, emerging technology, especially the last two years, will continue to grow and emerge. But I, you know, I wanna challenge this board in, it's not an immediate issue, but it's something we need to think about from an operational perspective, as well from a legislative perspective, and how regulations that may be coming down from the federal and state really affect our operations here as a government entity. Um, it's not hard to connect the dots to see how AI could be used in our HR process or procurement processes, risk management, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, you know, while we do, we, we are big on local control, there is an element of taking the human decision-making piece away. Um, and I think it, it's something that the board needs to be aware of and, and continue to think about. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Galano to give a more in-depth update on, on the federal side of things. And then we'll turn it over to Karen, and I'll, I'll be back to close. So, Michael, you may kick it away. Hello, Michael. Great. Good morning, Joe. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, good morning to the board. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, I'm Mike Galano with Holland and Knight. Uh, my colleague Rich Gold also says hello. Appreciate your time this morning. We wanted to give you an update on the federal level. Uh, from for Placer County priorities and the agenda with a look towards 2024. So um, as you know well, we are uh, in the middle of divided government here at the federal level. Um, the Republicans uh, regained control of the House at the start of the 118th Congress. 
um, with very narrow majorities. So uh, at the moment, there are uh, 434 seats are filled in the House of the 435 total. Republicans hold a three seat majority. So razor thin in the House uh, on the Senate side, the Democrats uh, hold majority over there, 51-49. Um, again, very tight majorities. So um, as we forecasted coming into the year, a uh, fair amount of gridlock here at the federal level, uh, which we've seen probably the last decade, but what we haven't seen uh, is that, you know, it used to be kind of Republican versus Democrat, uh, but in the last year or so, it's really turned, uh, the gridlock is even seen within the parties. Um, so a very challenging environment at the federal level um, to get legislation completed, uh, but certainly a number of victories to report in a moment. Um, next slide. Again, um, looking forward to 2024, Republicans have a three seat majority at the moment. Uh, given that it's a, a presidential year, as Joel noted, the expectation is that um, the House is very much in play. So um, there are 14 seats that Republicans hold at the moment that President Biden won in the last election. So uh, it, even if he performs, um, below historical averages, pretty good chance um, the Democrats could regain control of the House. Obviously, uh, we're still a year out, and that's an eternity at the federal level, but um, his historical trends would indicate the House is in play. Uh, next slide. The opposite is true in the Senate. The uh, Democrats have a very challenging map. They are defending... Um, 23 of 33 seats that are up in 2024, including three that um, uh, President Trump won in the last election. So Montana, uh, Ohio, and um, uh, Florida. So very challenging headwinds uh, for the Democrats in the Senate, which, which could indicate a flip uh, on the Senate side. So uh, next slide. You know what what that all means on the on the funding side is that uh, again fair amount of gridlock, as you all know the federal fiscal year 24 began on October 1st. In, in a perfect world, Congress would have completed action on all 12 of its appropriations bills prior to October 1st. Um, clearly, that did not happen. So uh, what was required was a continuing resolution to keep the federal government open. Um, and you recall uh, much of the drama that unfolded in late September with former Speaker McCarthy um, passing a clean CR at FY23 levels, which led to a, a call to vacate the chair. And ultimately, uh, he was removed from, from his position. Um, that really set us back about six weeks as the Republicans um, uh, chose a new, a new speaker. So... Um, the CR, which was passed in September, expired November 17th. And because of the delay in selecting a new speaker, we needed to uh, pass a second continuing resolution, which uh, is has two expiration dates. The first expires January 19th, which is 38 days from now. That funds four departments at the federal level. And the second expires on uh, February 2nd. That, will, that funds... Um, the remaining eight federal departments. So um, very challenging environment. The, the good news, really the great news, next slide, uh, is that even in, in, in a challenging environment, um, the California delegation was very supportive of Placer County's uh, community project funding requests. We have uh, two projects uh, currently funded, one in the House, one in the Senate. 1.5 million pending for the Baker Ranch wildfire defense planning project um, that Senator Padilla was able to secure and a million dollars for the sheriff departments for its portable radio project um, that Congressman Kiley was able to secure. Additionally, uh, in the DOD 
appropriations report, Congressman Kiley was able to have some language included um, to push DOD to expedite cleanup of um, former missile sites. We know that's uh, an important issue in Placer County. Next slide. In addition to the, the funding side of the house, um, the county has been very active on the policy front in just a few that we noted. Um, yeah, HR 1586, the Forest Protection and Wildfire Safety Act, that uh, is legislation from Congressman LaMalfa that would clarify um, Department of Interior and Department of Agriculture can uh, use fire retardant uh, when, when treating uh, fires on federal lands. That is in response to some pending litigation uh, that would clarify the issue on that. Uh, we're pleased that that bill is at a committee, uh, two committees in the House, and it's also moving in the Senate, and we're hoping to get that finalized uh, early next year. Uh, again, the Lake Tahoe Restoration and Reauthorization Act, um, that comes up every 10 years. Um, that is important, obviously, for the region, not just uh, on the California side, but also on the Nevada side. And then another big one, um, the Farm Bill reauthorization, and we heard a lot of folks earlier in the meeting talk about uh, Placer County's legacy on agriculture, and, and certainly uh, this bill is important to all the farmers in the community, but also uh, important to counties in general because this is uh, sets the authorization levels for the the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which you know formerly known as as the Food Stamp Program. So uh, Congress has extended. Uh, the Farm Bill through next September, and they will be working uh, on that uh, over the next eight months. So next slide. Uh, had a very robust and uh, productive advocacy trip uh, when the county was out for the Business Alliance Conference. Uh, we spent time on Capitol Hill, both the House and the Senate. Also um, spent time with the House Agricultural Committee to talk about the leadership role that the county's played on wildfire and help uh, help shape policy on the farm bill coming up next year. And then we visited another half dozen or so federal departments uh, to meet with senior staff on a variety of issues, both on uh, infrastructure and on uh, wildfire and other issues. Uh, so next slide. Um, so looking ahead to 24, uh, assuming Congress can pass the appropriations bills early next year, we should be fairly regular order for FY25 requests. So you, by this time, you're all very familiar with the earmark process. Um, we will en again engage there with the delegation to secure uh, projects, project funding, in, in, in kind of the 500,000 to $3 million range for county priorities. Uh, we will also participate in the competitive federal grant process um, that was funded through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. And then finally, um, the federal formula programs that the county benefits from. Uh, we don't um, participate too directly here uh, from an advocacy standpoint, although there are times when uh, those programs, the, the formulas are at risk, and we do engage with the delegation when that occurs. Uh, next slide. Some important dates looking ahead. Uh, obviously, we are in the middle of 2024 planning. Uh, early next year, the second session of the 118th Congress will be seated on, on January 9th. Uh, the, the, the first deadline on approach expires 19th, the second, the set, February 2nd. And then uh, really the, the work begins in February. That's when uh, Joel and, and with our support will be transmitting uh, the project request to the delegation for FY25 community project funding. And then uh, shortly afterwards, uh, as we expect uh, on the cap to cap trip, we will be back up again on Capitol Hill with, with you all and advocating for, for county priorities. So uh, I think we'll pause there and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any questions from uh, board members? I've got to turn my light on here. Uh, I see none. So thank you. We will move on to 
State. Hello, Karen. Normally, I'm never accused of needing a microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me, Karen Lang with Shai Yoder, Antony Schmelzer, and Lang, your state legislative advocate, uh, here to sort of depress you a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but I'll try to get there as best I can. Um, as far as where we are in the point in time, our, our system is a little bit different than uh, DC's. So um, right now, we're in the middle of the two-year term. The legislature adjourned in the middle of uh, September. The governor worked on signing and vetoing legislation through the middle of October. And then um, it really quieted down for the time being. Uh, and when we adjourned for the year, as Joel had noted, about 3,000 bills uh, had been introduced. The governor signed 1,171. He vetoed 156. The reason I wanted to observe to you the point in time is because any bill that didn't make it out of its first house, so if it's a Senate bill and it didn't get out of the Senate, or it's an Assembly bill and it didn't get out of the Assembly, it, ha it, it still has a second chance to do that by the end of January. Uh, and then if those bills move forward, um, they sort of get a second life. If they don't get out of their first house uh, by the end of January, you can actually kind of take a deep breath about that bad bill. Um, but there are a lot of bills that made it to the second house and are parked, and there's one important one I'll, I'll get to in a minute, but um, those bills, as long as they made it out of, the second, or out of the first house into the second house, really have until the end of the second year to either get to the governor or die. And so there's a lot of additional work on your staff um, to kind of, um, you know, because there's all the bills that were introduced that are still alive, and then all the new ones that they're going to introduce um, as we move towards the end of February 24. So there'll be, um, you know, probably an additional 2,500 or so bills plus the lingerers. Um, one of them is AB 702, which I'm sure your chief probation officer has flagged for Joel, and that will be heard as a two-year bill um, in January, and it is a, has some pretty devastating impacts on uh, your juvenile justice funding stream, so we'll be um, working on uh, trying to corral opposition to that. Um, it was a very busy year in Sacramento. Major legislation that really ran the gamut um, was introduced, and a lot of it went to the governor. I'll, I'll touch on the constitutional amendments. Um, major action around behavioral health, which your county uh, team knows about. A lot of work on renewable energy. There's an infrastructure package that emerged in the middle of the year from the governor. Uh, several uh, proposals on minimum wage and public safety, uh, particularly fentanyl, um, were discussed and debated in Sacramento throughout 23. Um, and then finally, as you're acutely aware, and Supervisor Gustafson heard, <laughs> the delay in the tax deadline has definitely complicated and um, made very challenging our budget situation, uh, which we will get a more detailed proposal from the governor around January 10th when he releases his first cut at the 24-25 budget. Um, before I get to all the depressing news, I did want to cover a couple of bills um, that the county very specifically was interested in 2023, AB 1668 by Assemblymember Patterson. Uh, he carried legislation to increase the number of liquor licenses allowed uh, in the county of Placer. Those are all statutorily limited, believe it or not. Uh, and you have to, whenever you want to increase the number countywide, you have to run legislation. He carried legislation to create some new opportunities for businesses uh, within, um, I think really the focus was inside city limits, but he successfully carried that legislation. Your senator, Senator Nilo, carried legislation that will finally create a solution for county auditors that are struggling to account for the trial court employees, which are not your employees. You don't negotiate their contracts or anything like that, but because they used to be and there was never a mechani mechanism to separate them for reporting purposes, trial court employees still were showing up as yours in your uh, GASB reports. Senator Nilo, um, accountant that he is at heart, was able to carry the legislation through. It does require county by county activity, so your county administrator or auditor would need directly would need to work directly with the uh, supervising um, judge and the administrator of the courts here locally in Placer to begin that work locally. It's there's no automatic thing that happens, but it finally creates the legislative authority that you needed, um, sort of to get them off your books. You're carrying employees that aren't yours and. You have to have a actuarially sound reporting system, so it's um, it was needed legislation, and it was signed into law. AB three thirty eight by Assemblymember Aguiar Curry, our new majority leader. Um, this is the second time she'd carried this bill, and she, unfortunately, it was uh, successful this year. Um, it did increase uh, wages for contracts that are paid over a certain amount um, for folks that are doing vegetation management. 
um, this will drive up the cost of fire prevention. It's it's just no more um, it's no more complicated than that. And uh, we were part of a coalition in opposition. The county was opposed to it based on cost and obviously the fire risk you face here. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was approved and the governor did sign it. And in addition, AB 505 by Assemblymember Ting, um, this bill created uh, mid, essentially midstream, and I don't want to mince words about this. You're in the middle of implementing the juvenile justice realignment, uh, and this bill created a bunch of new requirements on your probation uh, chief and the team that's working on implementing that midstream and creates additional reporting when there are already, I believe, 11 reports. Uh, we were very active in trying to block the bill. We got within one vote on the Senate floor. Unfortunately, uh, we could not stop it, and it did get to the governor, and he signed it. And that also is in addition to AB um, 702 that's coming up in January uh, that we're going to need to be uh, working to oppose as well. Um, and then 584, SB 584, this is a two-year bill. But I really wanted to emphasize it because it has, um, I think, very acute uh, impacts on the Tahoe area in particular. This is a measure that was sponsored by the California Labor Federation to tax short-term rentals that uh, at the beginning of the bill had a, you know, a, a certain amount of money was coming in attributable to that specific address um, that would create a, um, a fund from the tax to fund uh, affordable housing development uh, throughout the state. A couple of huge problems with the bill. One, there was no return to source. So basically, you'd be taxing places where the housing was in the most acute shortage and then potentially taking that money, which is needed locally, and you're going to go build it somewhere else. That was an enormous problem. Um, frankly, the um, having the state tax it was not great. You have local TOT measures in place. The counties are more than capable of handling that locally, as are cities. Um, what we did to try to, uh, I, to not wall off, but to distinguish the very unique circumstances that um, Plaster faces, we paired together with uh, um, the County of Nevada and the County of Marin to try to have a very unique um, voice in that uh, the debate on that bill because of the, the constraints that you're facing locally in places where there's a lot of tourism and a housing shortage combined. The bill was held in the second house, so it is technically alive through all of 2024. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with staff on the bill about the operationalize, operationalizing it. There were concerns from the league, from CSAC, about the return to source. I'm not sure um, if the author is going to abandon ship or if she's going to try to revive it in some uh, new form. The, the overall governance of short-term rentals in California has been the subject of a lot of legislation over the years. None of it has gotten through. Um, what my experience has been is that counties are well served to continue articulating that you already are able to manage TOT and short-term rentals locally. If the state wants to give you more tools, great. But um, the no, not being able to return those funds to the source where they came from was enormously problematic if the problem they're trying to solve is affordable housing funding and availability. So I, I anticipate, well, if we're not working on SB 584, there's going to be probably another bill that comes along that looks like it. So um, I anticipate working on that some more. Uh, Karen, Supervisor Gustafson has a question. Thank you. Um, I wasn't familiar with the Senate bill. Wasn't there also an Assembly bill, uh, 1440? Was it 1440? Or was this the only bill on the short, with this concept? This was the big one. Okay. This was the big one. There have okay. been other bills um, that have been authored on short-term rentals, um, but this one and then previously SB 555, which was trying to remove collection from the counties and give it to the state. Okay. Well, I appreciate the attention on that. Um, we are trying to solve the problem, but they will never give us back the funds that we generate. So thank yes. you. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, I wanted to just touch on a couple other pieces of significant legislation, and I apologize in advance if I don't cover one that you are following with 3,000 bills. <laughs> just trying to touch on the ones that um, we know counties care a whole heck of a lot about. Um, notably, SB 43 by Senator Eggman, um, this bill has been signed into law. You do have time to enact it. You don't have to deal with this on Gen 1 if you need more time. This expands the definition of the term gravely disabled uh, for the purposes of conservatorship. And it also will allow uh, family members to petition for conservatorship. Um, it, include, it expanded in the statute uh, to cover uh, chronic alcoholism. Um, this is... Uh, it was a pretty controversial bill because it ultimately means compulsory treatment for individuals that need 
um, assistance. And the uh, author's office did take amendments to allow counties some additional time uh, to opt in. You can do it as soon as Gen 1, 2024. You have until the end of 2026 uh, to, to act. What we've seen a couple counties do is say no sooner than X date, but not run the clock all the way out. Um, mainly, it's a, it's a staff resources issue. Um, this, this takes time and, and resources, especially in your conservatorship or your, um, your conservator, uh, public guardian, public conservator office. Um, there's, it's been one of the most neglected um, state programs as far as funding and resources made available to counties. And there just are not enough staff in counties to deal with what would be an increased uh, caseload. So there's some additional time. We also understand Senator Eggman, even in the budget environment we're heading into, that she plans on prioritizing seeking additional resources for counties um, to fund their public guardian, public conservator, um, and your county offices to, to operationalize this bill. The other bill, SB 35 by <laughs> Senator Umberg, this is follow-up legislation on the care court model, which if you're following along sort of SB 35 and the care court is the almost the predecessor to SB 43. So generally you're gonna assume folks that uh, are conserved under SB 43 may have been attempted to get into services by SB 35 um, or to, by the care court. Um, there are five counties that are early implementers of that model. It's been a little slow to start, I believe just a handful of petitions in San Diego County, for example. Um, so we're watching how the first few counties handle it and what their issues are and trying to relay that to the counties that are um, in the cohort two model which you are in. Um, in addition, uh, on mental health, this is a big one for your constituents. This will be on the March 24 ballot. Uh, there were other items on the March 24 ballot that the governor proactively asked the legislature to move to November because this is the one proposition he wanted on the March ballot. And the proposition is essentially the combination of two pieces of legislation. Uh, AB 531 by Assemblymember Irwin is the, is the money part, meaning new money, new resources, the bond. And then SB 326 also by Senator Eggman um, is the, essentially the overall of what is currently referred to as MHSA, and this is being if the voters approve it, would reshape it into the Behavioral Health Services Act. This is um, the source of funding for SB 326 is the 1% tax on California's millionaires. The money is distributed to all 58 counties by a formula. Um, and, and your local uh, mental health uh, committee has, over the years, met and convened and developed how you want to roll out the funds locally. Uh, this reshapes that pretty dramatically if it were to pass and requires that a pretty significant chunk go to housing first. Uh, there's a component of this for veterans specifically, um, but it does reshape your discretion over your local dollars that were part of the original MHSA Act, which was approved by the voters several years ago. Um, this is on uh, the March ballot. The piece that's actually polling the best and this is receiving about 60% voter approval right now, according to the PPIC poll that was released last week. Um, this will do two really notable things. It, it will generate about six, a little over $6 billion in, in funding that will be made available to locals to build mental health facilities and mental health beds, in particular locked facilities, which is an issue that counties everywhere across the state are facing, which is what do you do with mentally ill offenders that you can't place anywhere, this creates a source of funding for that population. Um, it also will allow essentially by right ministerial review in uh, non-residential areas to build those beds, which um, is not a small thing. <laughs> so just wanted to flag those two items for you. Uh, CSAC worked really hard going into the final negotiations on these to um, preserve as much discretion as possible on the expenditure of the funds locally. Um, there were some really hard conversations, as I'm sure Supervisor Gore is acutely familiar with. Um, it was a very challenging situation to have a source of local funds be reshaped in that way. Uh, and, and the governor's office was really dug in on how it was gonna go down. Uh, and, and I don't think that folks were entirely thrilled with how it turned out uh, as far as what's showing up on the March ballot. And so I, I would leave it with that. I'm happy to answer any questions, but it was a hard conversation. C CSAC worked very hard, but there were some pretty uh, non-negotiables from the administration. Thank you, Karen. Any questions from uh, board members, comments? <clears throat> I see none. Thank you very much for your oh, report. We have a few, we have a few more slides. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. sorry. Very quickly, uh, oh, there's, there's an infrastructure more. package. Uh, the governor did try to um, uh, include the Delta Tunnel, which is now out for their EIR 
uh, the final EIR is out for review, but he did use it once it was passed to accelerate the construction of Sites Reservoir, which is a big deal for uh, water resources in the state. Uh, and then very quickly, there will be four constitutional uh, measures on the November ballot. Two of them were moved there by the governor. Um, ACA 1, which would lower the voter approval amount to 55% for capital expenditure products, uh, uh, capital expenditure projects, uh, housing, affordable housing, um, some transportation related items. There will be no uh, ability to use those funds for salaries or overhead, only for actual capital expenditure. ACA 5, which strikes out Proposition 8 from the, um, the Constitution, it's already been struck down, but still in the statute. ACA 13 Ward um, is sort of a counter um, punch to the Business Roundtable uh, proposal, which ties, um, it increases the threshold for local approved measures to uh, essentially two thirds of the voters' approval. ACA 13 says basically if, you, if it takes two thirds to approve something going forward, it should take two thirds to get it on the ballot. I'm not sure if they'll pull it off or not, but that's a big one. And then SCA 2 uh, Allen repeals Section 38 of the Constitution, which bans the um, use of public, um, public dollars to fund uh, low-income housing. And then there are seven other initiatives that are on the November ballot. Um, they're all here for you to see. I did want to flag, the reason I'm putting this in here is these are qualified, but not for sure going to appear. Definitely number seven, which is the fast food minimum wage law, has already been the subject of an agreement and it should be pulled off the ballot. Proponents who put things on the ballot by signature have until about the month of June to strike deals with the legislature on things and then they can pull them, they can tell the, the Secretary of State not to put it on the June or on the November ballot. And so that matters for um, the negotiations in the legislature. Uh, there's definitely, there's a minimum wage proposal, which, you know, Joel had touched on. So there's a couple different items here that could be the subject of um, intense negotiation leading into June. Uh, and then on the budget outlook, um, $68 billion deficit. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, that's a tough number to solve for. I did want to flag a few things. The state does have about $30 billion in reserves that it can call upon to help solve part of the problem. It is a three-year problem because the, um, the money we're supposed to collect before the close of the 2022-23 budget, not all that came in because of the delay. Uh, and then the budget year we're in, we're um, a $17 billion deficit in the budget year that we are in because we didn't know what it was going to be until five months after the budget year started and then, the, and then the budget year we're planning for. So there's going to be a lot of hard decisions to be made. Uh, and this is not a, a legislature that's ever faced a deficit before. And so, um, and on top of that, you have massive changes in leadership in the assembly that, um, you know, I think make these conversations even harder. I would say um, to the resources issue, generally when the state is running a deficit like this, uh, the thing that becomes very popular is general obligation bonds, because then you can fund things uh, if the voters say yes, that you don't have to take out of the general fund right away. You have to pay debt service on it, but you can, um, you can fund things through resources bonds, for example. So I do think um, for those of you serving on this, the, the Tahoe Conservancy, for example, um, there will be uh, likely requests for input on the structure of the bond um, as we get closer to June. Generally, they do need to make a decision to put things on the ballot for November by June. I think they're going to wait to see what the voters do on Prop 1 first and then get really serious. There are 15 proposed bonds in the legislature right now. I think that the resources bond probably has the best chance of passing, especially if we have another El Nino winter. So I think you'll see the resources bond probably get the lion's share of attention. And like as Joel mentioned, we have um, some leadership transitions occurring in February in the Senate. Senator McGuire will become the new pro tem of the state Senate. He's a former county supervisor, which is always a good thing <laughs> because he understands what you do. We hope. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we hope, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, recent changes in the assembly leadership, um, that changes... Uh, there's been some hard things happening in the assembly. I won't, I'll try to be careful how I say it. And then uh, in addition, there are 34 initiatives currently in circulation that could be on the November 2024 ballot. So we're never bored in Sacramento. Uh, and now I'm trying to go hurry through the end, but I'm happy to answer any questions and I apologize for anything I skipped over. It was a very, very busy year. Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Karen. Supervisor Landon has a question. Uh, I don't have any questions for you in particular. If there's any other questions for her, I just had some no. questions for Joel. Any questions? All righty, I see none. Okay, moving on. So part of this presentation is to bring Another before your now. board a draft legislative platform. And I wanna highlight some of the, the major changes uh, going from 23 to 2024. Um, so the first bullet, the state route 49 bridge debris removal, the county was successful in receiving $8 million from the state budget a few years ago. 
to clean up the bridge debris that currently sits at the confluence of the American River. We are looking to indemnify the county for this project as it, as it is a goodwill environmental uh, project. And so we are looking to sponsor a bill um, that provides the county indemnity, indemnification or some type of safe harbor provision. Um, county, the county staff's working with county council. And I think there's a meeting uh, later this week with various legislative committee consultants to start drafting the language. Um, and then we will be begin the process should the board approve of uh, this legislative platform of identifying an author to carry this bill. Uh, the second piece is some regional forest health uh, priorities we're adding. Um, the big one on this, on this section is a carbon credit market. Uh, the county wants to recognize the value in the investments that the board has been making uh, to clean up and, and thin our forests and understanding that should a fire not happen or should a fire happen, that the carbon released into the atmosphere would be less because of the work uh, that this county has been doing. So we want to recognize that both at the state and federal level because there's a value to that. The third bullet here is the Santini Burton slash Southern Nevada Public Lands Act. So this is a, a Santini Burton's a federal piece of legislation that was approved back in the 1980s. What it, and the Southern Nevada Public Lands Act modifies the Santini Burton Act, which is, which is why you see those two together. But what the county is looking to do along with our stakeholders in the Tahoe region, is to modify the Santini Burton Act, which currently allows the federal government to spend money that is received based on land sales from the Las Vegas area, as well as land leases from the Las Vegas area, in the Tahoe Basin for environmental improvements, but basically only to purchase land is what the law says at this point. Over the years, the Santini Burton Act and the Lake Tahoe Restoration Act basically do the same thing. And so there's, there's a push to modify the Santini Burton Act to create more flexibility uh, and to free up that pot of funding that's currently sitting at the federal level to farther the Tahoe um, EIP, Environmental Improvement Program, but for different uses than what the current Lake Tahoe Restoration Act allows. Um, so that's a big push. Uh, the fourth bullet here, minor consent to mental health services uh, for Medi-Cal. So what this does is currently through the private insurance market, youth ages 12 or older are allowed to seek um, outpatient counseling services. Uh, what we're asking or staff is asking the board for approval of is to support legislation that now mirrors what private insurance is allowed to do with what Medi-Cal insurance should be allowed to do. So for those folks that are 12 or older on Medi-Cal, they cannot seek uh, outpatient counseling services without uh, parental approval. But if you're on private insurance, uh, you're allowed to. So we want to sync those, those laws up. Um, it's difficult for our providers in the county uh, to figure out what type of insurance. Uh, it's difficult um, even for families and youth to understand what type of insurance they have. Um, moving on, on the transportation and passenger rail piece, there's a few here. Uh, we did identify specific projects, baseline road improvements. Um, I do want to mention Wallega Road Bridge is actually complete. It looks beautiful. This should uh, read Watt Avenue Bridge. Uh, so that's, that's something that uh, we'll fix in the platform, but it should be Watt Avenue Bridge. And then the, the, the board uh, was successful. Some of our stakeholders were successful in expanding passenger rail through the Capitol Corridor, a 40-ish million dollar grant uh, a few months ago. We now want to take that and move it uh, from Roseville and Auburn up, up east and, and eventually into Reno uh, to allow, ultimately, the major plan is you can get people from the Bay Area, San Jose, all the way up to Tahoe and to Reno without uh, getting out of their car or getting in their car, so to speak. Uh, this does a few things. Um, most importantly, it frees traffic on I-80. So I-80 is an, an important, obviously, freeway for the residents here, but it's a huge interstate commerce um, piece for, for this nation and the economy. And so it frees up trucks to get from the Port of Oakland, the Port of San Francisco, to transport uh, goods um, all the way uh, to east. Um, and so the more cars we can get off I-80, the better. This is also an, an important idea as we focus on other transportation projects such as Placer Parkway with the ultimate goal of, of, getting, of reducing traffic on I-80. 
And then the third bullet under transportation is local control with a road user charge. So the, the point of this, of this item is as EVs continue to gain market share in the state and nationally, uh, road maintenance is funded by the gas tax. Um, counties and cities are seeing a reduction uh, in gas tax revenues. And so the state, both the state of California and, and most states across the country as well as nationally have recognized this. And so what the federal government and the state government are trying to do is create alternatives to our current uh, funding structure for road maintenance. What staff is asking the board for permission for is to allow staff to then advocate to the state or feds that the local governments should be included in this discussion. I mentioned earlier in the presentation a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, whether that, you know, VMT may not fit for Placer County. Um, I've heard um, a unique charge of charging by the weight of vehicles during registration. That may not fit for the county. So we want to be able to have staff identify certain or basically bring in local control for the county and, hey, help the state and the, and the feds identify what could work um, for this unique jurisdiction. And the last two bullets here relate to public safety, uh, sexually vi violent predators, which I know the board is, is very aware of. Uh, this specific ask is that, that we staff support efforts to not allow the release of sexually violent predators on transient status, uh, which is the key folks there. And I know our, um, our district attorney and sheriff um, have have quite the campaign going that's been going on for a while, and I know the board's been, been heavily involved. So it's now to formalize um, the opposition to this. And then the last bullet is felony incompetent to stand trial. Uh, IST is what it's known in the growth cap and penalty program. A few years ago, the state passed a law to limit, uh, penalize counties uh, that are sending over a certain limit um, of folks that are under incompetent to stand trial, felony incompetent to stand trial, to the Department of State Hospitals. They want locals to keep those individuals in their community to hopefully restore them to comp competence before they have to be uh, sent to the state. So recently, Department of State Hospitals has started this penalty program. Um, and most counties, I think, are now above, and above that growth cap that they set, and which is it's clearly not working. And so the idea is to, hey, let's, let's get together as counties uh, throughout the state and jurisdictions and figure out something that can work. Um, so that's, that's that last piece here. Um, with that, before I move on, I want to uh, take any questions on these changes or any other changes or additions, removals uh, the board may wish to see um, in the legislative platform. Ready. Any questions, comments from board members? Supervisor Landon. Um, I'm not sure if I should say this till later or not, so if it's a better discussion for after you finish the last couple of slides, I'm fine waiting. But um, I think my question is around, so I noticed on one of Karen's slides, it said the county should prepare to play a lot of defense in 2024. And what I think my question is for, for my colleagues as well as for you is how can we play more offense with the state and are there ways that opportunities like what we did with the drug needle exchange program where thankfully our sheriff noticed that something was coming and we were able to preempt a move by the state and so looking for opportunities where, I mean, I know with 3,000 plus bills coming forward, it's difficult to be able to pay attention to those things. But I would be very supportive of trying to uh, catch things as we, at the very, very outset, to try and preempt things here at the local level and maybe put ordinances in place or do things like that to help off, just play some offense, honestly. Um, and so I'm wondering if there are opportunities that you see and whether we have the staff capability to do things like that. Well, I'll answer that question and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you if you have any additional thoughts, Karen. Um, so on the offense piece, uh, really great point. I will say one of the reasons uh, my, I'm, I'm here is the board <laughs> said, hey, we want to be less reactive than we have been over the years, and we do want to be more proactive um, in this realm, not, only, not just with the budget piece, but with all, all legislation. Um, 
There certainly are, are avenues. We do, we do know the legislators, we, both Karen and I, we, we know what they want to accomplish. Uh, so there's that piece. We're not, uh, we're not going to know everything, and there's going to be a, a, a defensive piece to this. Additionally, with the, with the size of the budget deficit that's occurring, um, because of the harm and impacts certain cuts may have on not just counties and cities, but to nonprofits or, or special interest groups to say, there could be a lot of things discussed or talked about kind of behind the scenes, right? Where it's, you just have one day, a day or two to react and, and that's, that's near impossible uh, to know until it happens. Um, you know, I will say our, our state advocates are, are, are plugged in to kind of the, the day-to-day realities down in Sacramento and, and keep me well informed of that. Um, a, a lot of the offense we do play, and, and I see the role continuing, is we have tremendous leadership in this county, not at the board level, uh, not only at the board level, but at our, our department head, Good department catch. head level, <laughs> <laughs> at our department head level and elected official level. And to this county's credit, our staff take a leadership role in the state through, through the various associations that they may be a part of. Uh, they keep me informed. We work really well together. And it's, it's helped tremendously um, through the work we've done in this county. And a lot of the work is, is done because something doesn't happen. And, and it's, it's not easy for the public or folks to see that, but there is a lot of work that happens to stop things before they even become real. And so, uh, you know, that continued partnership and relationships that uh, the board has and I have and, and our staff has uh, with our state associations and with each other is going to be tremendously helpful. Um, there's going to be a lot of times where I'm, I'm you know, talking with, with board of supervisors, with our county executive officer, with county council, and quickly understanding how things may affect us and, and um, understanding kind of the strategies and helping the board understand the strategies we may be able to play uh, for a better offense uh, for the term you used. Uh, Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, very specifically on the bond development that will be discussed in 24, I think there's an opportunity to try to make sure that they, they, they I will say the legislature does not really do earmarks for very specific projects and bonds traditionally, but we always want to make sure that you're advantaged in every possible way on the pots of money. So that, that's a good place to play offense because that will be money. And it's sort of the, when you get there early and you touch how the language looks, when they go to implement the bond programs, you're in a, you should be in a naturally advantaged position because you were involved in how the criteria stacked up, for example. That's a good, um, very near-term opportunity. The reason I wanted to put the, the reason I included we're going to be playing defense, for the public's benefit, you are the state's operational arm of a lot of their big ideas. And what I've seen happen in my almost 20 years of lobbying is that when the state hits the financial skids, they tend to either say, you know what, counties, you can do this state program better and cheaper than we can. I'm going to realign it to you. Oh, and that's never great. And it's obviously playing out terribly with juvenile justice right now. And secondly, um, they tend to, you know, they'll try to make programmatic cuts. They'll say, we're going to reduce the amount of money that you're getting, but you still are not relieved of your obligations under the statute. And that's a brutal position to put you as counties in. And we want to be ready to push back as hard as possible on those kind of maneuvers that they're going to potentially make for their budget solutions, right? Because they, as a, as a matter of the state constitution, we have to have a constitutionally balanced budget. We don't deficit spend the way the federal government does. So there's, there's things that they do that look good on paper that are nightmares for you and your staff to figure out how to actually make work and make government work at the local level. So that was the point about the defense part, but there are going to be opportunities to be, you know, in an offensive position working to try to make sure you're advantaged in bonds and you know, there might be proposals that we like and we want to make them even better, that kind of a thing. And that's iterative to whatever gets put into print. So, and then we're, Joel is very, very good about um, flagging things pretty quickly, I think, as well. What I, I do want to uh, quickly add to that, because when we talk about the, the state budget deficit, and, and we've talked about it a little bit here today, uh, there was an additional concerning piece within the LAO's report that mentioned that not only do you have a $68 billion deficit basically now, it's expected, it's not structurally sound. Our, our state budget and revenue, um, our revenue sources are not structurally sound and they're very volatile. 
is they expect a $30 billion deficit in the future years, ongoing. And so it's not, you're not going to just see one-time cuts. It's going to be those deep programmatic cuts. Um, and, and part of the offense, so what I've tried to do over the years, is really allow the counties the flexibility. If the state's going to realign services and we can't stop that, give us the flexibility to manage the program how we think it should be managed. Um, that's important. And um, obviously funding uh, with that realignment's very, very important, and we, and we try to do that. And, and that's harder in, in, a, in a budget deficit, um, especially an ongoing budget deficit. But as Karen mentioned, there are, there are ways we can do that. Um, it's, it takes a lot of communication, and, and I think we're well prepared for that. Supervisor Gustafson, you have a comment? Yeah, I have a couple um, comments. On the legislative platform on the uh, Eastern Placer passenger rail expansion, I think I've reported previously that the Nevada senators, Cortez Mastro and Jackie Rosen, are both very supportive, and Nevada is seen as a vulnerable state for the presidential elections. So uh, I think this would be a great time for our federal advocates to really push on that, as we saw with the $6 billion for Las Vegas to LA rail, um, to see what they can do to help us outside of California. Um, on the local control with road user charger Our charge, charges, yeah. um, on the offense, going to uh, Supervisor Landon's point, we have a long linear county with a lot of people traveling through it and those people depending on how they determine odometer readings or how they're going to do this we also need to know where they traveled so that our roads pick up our share of funding especially in the high tourism areas or the high recreation areas so everything kind of going east out of auburn you know those are not commute trips uh, typically, and so making sure that we're uh, being proactive in educating those um, that are determining how those user charges are going to be uh, set aside, that it isn't returned to where the vehicle's from, but it's returned to where the vehicle is used. Okay. Um, very important. And then um, on our legislative packet, I just had a couple of um, quick items. One is on page 11 where we call it homeowners insurance coverage in the WUI. Um, in talking to a number of insurance brokers, and again, I was reminded of this this morning, that we need to say property owners, because it includes businesses, are, are very challenged with getting fire insurance right now. And I would say it's not just within the WUI. Um, it's yeah. insurance in general. So uh, I heard the speaker said it's number two on his list of items to address this year. Um, uh, Assembly Member Patterson was at Medler's this morning and said it was number two on the list, and he's going to be working on it. So anything we can do there mm -hmm. um, to on insurance issues, and then on the on page eighteen, uh, item three, we talk about multi-jurisdictional collaboration for the region's housing needs. As we heard last week, and again this morning on public record. Um, you know, good planning is that the more intense uses or dense housing would be in our cities. And so while I know we have this language that's fairly general, um, you know, where can we as a county work with our cities to have a partnership to address housing so we're not spreading it out that we're really doing more infill? And we're going to talk about the infill mobility study. but. You know, give us the flexibility if we can partner with the city through a financial agreement that allows for more housing to be developed in cities, let the county get recognition versus spreading it out into rural communities. So anything we can do on that I think would be greatly appreciated uh, legislatively. Um, and I, I thought the rest of the package looked really good. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you, and I, I appreciate the comment about with those RENA numbers, how can we be more flexible and work with our cities? Uh, because you heard, right, the challenge of trying to, to have a zone, just zone for enough affordable housing when we're in unincorporated areas. Is, can I, um, is it okay to? Sure. There are a couple okay. counties that, and Solano County is a good example, where the county and the cities within have a sub-jurisdiction agreement where the cities take all the housing and they preserve the unincorporated 
part of the county for essentially agriculture and open space. And they have the Air Force Base there as well, which is a big component of it. But it can be done. Um, I think you would need to start the conversation with SACOG as well. You write Salon as part of ABAG. You're in SACOG. So you'd want to probably start there to have the conversation, but you can do it. It just involves being um, at the table with your cities. And it, it doesn't mean that it's perfectly smooth locally right. either. But it, but it just may give us some flexibility. And I think that's right to the point made earlier, um, flexibility. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. I totally agree. That's great to hear that there is a solution. Thanks. Um, Joel, just a, a couple of items uh, with the baseline road on page 17. Just baseline widening and safety improvements because it's not just widening we've got light um, signal lighting that we want to do before we ever get to widening baseline road all the way um, through county, Sutter County to Highway 99 so also includes safety improvements that gives us some flexibility if there's other grant funding um, that we can go after I think that's important um, and then um, on page 17, which is the housing and land use and transportation, um, I want to make sure, you know, there, that's where um, it says homeless assistance there, and it's about housing. I think it's really important, first, that we also advocate for emergency housing. I understand the county and the, the state and the federal priorities is housing first. But... We've seen that to be pretty much a failed policy, and homelessness has increased tremendously as a result. And emergency housing, which I just had the assemblyman come visit um, this morning, really gives us an opportunity to impact getting people off the streets um, before just putting them into a home without supportive housing. Um, and so in that vein, I really do think that we need to encourage housing with supportive services. and. We may need to move some of that into the HHS, mm -hmm. right? So you have uh, affordable housing and homeless assistance, but the homeless assistance is under the housing land use, and really it probably belongs under HHS, that whole portion, but really focusing on advocating for funds for emergency, emergency shelter. Um, that may not go very far um, in the legislature, but I do think that it is an important tool in the continuum. Um, and then housing with supportive services, I, if we look at that under the HHS platform. Um, and then I wanted to share with my colleagues and, and ask a question of my colleagues as Karen talked about Prop 1 um, coming before uh, the voters in March. And uh, I'd like to have our board talk about, a, a talk about whether or not we take a position on this, on this bill. Uh, I sat with the uh, CSAC staff as they were le negotiating at the last minute with the administration. Uh, and the administration really, um, that, it was more than a challenge. And I will tell you that counties throughout the state of California were not happy with the result. It felt like it ended up being sort of a, a benefit to urban counties, but rural counties are exempted out in a lot of areas. They're not exempted out. There are exceptions made for counties with 200,000 people and lower because there are mandates um, in this bill when it gets, if it gets passed, there are mandates which really mandate how we spend our dollars. Uh, right now, the county, our county has um, funds from an MSHA. We have been able to be really flexible in how we use those dollars, whether it's um, preventative mental health services, um, and we've been able to be flexi flexible with behavioral health, um, substance abuse, um, housing. We've been able to move the pots around. Prop 1 mandates how we spend our dollars, um, and it provides very little flexibility, which means a whole lot more work on our staff's side, having to meet these mandates. Um, and then we probably will have to backfill dollars from our general fund to continue the good work that we are already doing as a county. And I look at this, and it's once again um, a one-size-fits-all, which doesn't fit counties. And I don't know, Supervisor Holmes, if yes. RCRC has yes. taken a position. Right, we're, we're in the same position. We're opposed to it. So they've taken a position to <clears throat> yeah. oppose. Um, CSAC chose to take no position and they chose to take we chose to take no position because we had rural um, counties in favor because this 
$6.38 billion bond measure will definitely benefit the rural counties a lot more, excuse me, the urban counties a lot more than the, the rural counties. So we felt like it was important for counties to advocate for or against Prop 1 based on how it affects the counties individually. Um, so I would really like for us to take a position um, to oppose the bill, but have a further conversation in January before the absolutely. ballots go out. Yeah. And I'm not sure what my colleagues think, but I think it's yeah, worth the conversation. Okay. Uh, listen, we got some people in the audience that need to go back to work. Um, so, Mr. Galano, do you have any further comments? No, sir. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. So, um, this is a uh, we're, we're to provide staff direction on the draft 2024 legislative platform. Is there any request to add or change uh, changes to the platform? Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate oh, it. public comment. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item on the public at the public? Is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, thank you, Mike Garabedian, Placer County tomorrow, and uh, Pacific to American Divide. Speaking as someone who was the Chief of Staff in the State Senate for five years and an Associate Counsel in the New York Assembly for nine years, plus additional sessions for another two other Assembly people. Um, I'm uh, talking about the idea of having Placer Parkway serve as a relief, relief for I-80. This means bringing up truck traffic and other traffic up 65 and across Placer Parkway, which makes no sense. I would just expose the people of that, that entire area uh, to that kind of traffic. Um, the, uh, and the question of WUI, the county has created the WUI and it continues to create WUI in its minor division uh, uh, committee. Uh, the, so the county is ultimately responsible for the problems we're having with insurance unless the county decides through planning to tackle that issue and stop the multiplication of divisions upon divisions, which at one point were illegal and which the county at this point, because the legislature changed it, the county can say no to further divide it, division of land one more, one after the other after the other, because it is in effect a subterfuge if legal it's a subterfuge of the subdivision ordinance to have that kind of bad planning going on and misleading people and causing them to not get insurance. So uh, I have a couple, a couple, those couple problems with this legislative agenda. I think it's really wrong that our public works director keeps talk has talked about the Placer Parkway as a relief for I-80. And another excuse to build the, the interchange at 80 and 65 and widen 65, which will not relieve uh, the uh, congestion. And the fact that Placer County Transportation Agency keeps insisting that, that in trying to get the public to go support, putting a measure on the ballot next year is misleading and it's not responsible. And adding that kind of thing with this program is not a good idea for your legislative clout. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other comments? No, Chairman. Alrighty, we will close public comment. Do you have enough direction, um, Mr. George? I do. Thank you, Chairman. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Oh. All right. So now we will move to our 10, 10 a.m. timed item. Assessor Commendation Denise Spantos, Spanos. And thank you for your, uh, for your patience with us. We appreciate it. So I have a commendation to read into the record. And then I'll open it up for the county assessor and you to make some comments after the board member comments. All right, this is a matter, in, matter of a commendation recognizing Denise Spanos for more than 26 years of dedicated service as an employee of Placer County, and that includes the time you spent in the audience today. Whereas Denise, Denise Spanos is retiring from the County of Placer after serving the Placer County Sheriff's Office and Assessor's Office cumulatively for more than 26 years. Whereas Denise began her employment as an administrative clerk with the Sheriff's Office in 1997, 
before transferring to the assessor's office as an information technology technician in 2003. Denise was promoted to information technology specialist in 2008, and whereas Denise has provided exceptional service to the assessor's office for 20 years, managing hardware, software, and logistics to ensure efficiency. Denise provided technical and business process expertise, training, and critical process documentation to staff, coworkers, to ensure uninterrupted business processing. Denise provided database and programming assistance to streamline and improve upon existing workflows as, at the assessor's office. And whereas, whereas Denise assisted in the 20, 20, 2009 49 fire, fire information event for affected property owners and ensuring that all technical equipment functioned properly in the field office on limited notice so that the assessor's office could effectively provide assistance to constituents that suffered property loss. <clears throat> and whereas Denise played a vital role in processing the annual assessor role turnover, she processed a large quantity of work following detailed instructions and completing the task within the narrow time frame required each year. Denise worked with the megabyte systems to ensure new modules were tested, installed, and implemented. She acted as a liaison with megabyte systems to report problems and provide input for new functionality. And whereas Denise has been reliable and dependable in her duties, always proactive, concerned about efficiency, timeliness of response, and effectively communicating important and relevant information. And whereas Denise showed unwavering commitment and adaptability with a variety of technical challenge throughout her career, including supporting the technical needs of a staff of 80 during the sudden transition to work from home. And now therefore, let it be known that the above commendation was pat duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer at a regular meeting held on December 12, 2023, on behalf of the citizens of Placer County. And I will entertain a motion to approve this accommodation. So moved. I'll second. Moved by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Seeing no opposed or abstentions. Uh, now, are there any comments uh, board members would like to make? I will just briefly, if I may, Mr. Chair, sure. say thank you and congratulations. Uh, we have you. so many folks who work their careers here at the county, and you are a great example of somebody who has worked so very hard. So we really appreciate it and wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Jones. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that um, everything here on your resume is extremely <laughs> commendable. And this is well deserved. And thank, thank you. you very much for your service to the county and uh, to all of us and to the to the constituents in Placer County. Thank you. And Mr. Assessor, how are you going to get by without this? Thing? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a tough one. <laughs> all right. Would you like to make a few comments before I bring this no, down? I'd just like to say thank you. <laughs> oh, is there any public? Any comment from the public? Oh. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to go quick because I know how much Denise loves being the center of attention. Um, she's trying to crawl out of here as we speak. Um, I think you know there's a there's a good number of people here from my office um, to celebrate Denise's retirement, and I think that kind of shows um, how deeply missed she's going to be. Um, there's some people that are the backbone of an organization that kind of have their their fingers on everything. Denise is the perfect example of somebody like that for our, our organization. Um, there's not a single workstation or piece of equipment uh, in our office that uh, doesn't have her fingerprints all over. Um, I, I just want to personally thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, the, the, the amount of work that she did to get our office up and running during the pandemic. Um, we, are, we were full, fully functional and working from home within 10 days. Um, that's a staff of 80 that had never done that before, and she played a huge part in that. Um, and so I just want to personally thank you um, and let you know how much I'm personally going to miss you. And um, 
I wish you the, all the best in your retirement and congratulations. Thank you. Any well, anyone else in the public? Anyone online? That's it. All right, I'll bring this down. Okay. Matt, would you join us? Never done this. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> 29 years more. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very you much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to our 1015 timed item. Again, the Cessor GIS Parcel Mapping, mapping Services. Hello. Is it still morning? <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Dina Shoemaker, and I'm representing the Assessor's Office. And uh, along with me today is Matt Maynard, our um, Foster County's Assessor, and also Ashley Gabriel with um, our Fiscal and Administrative Officer. So I'm just going to go first provide you with some key background information, and then we'll state the requested actions which require your board's approval. So the Placer County Assessor's Office's mission is to discover, praise, and assess all taxable, real, and personal property within Placer County. As part of our mission, the assessor establishes and maintains approximately 7,400 parcels, parcel maps for every tax parcel in Placer County. These maps are the foundation for assessment of all real property in the county. The maps are also utilized by a multitude of stakeholders to make important geographic data-driven decisions on a regular basis. Stakeholders include property owners, businesses, real estate and development professionals, local jurisdictions, and other departments such as CEDRA, OES, Sheriff's Department. The challenge is that current assessor maps were created and maintained in AutoCAD for assessment purposes only. The maps created by AutoCAD don't have the ability to tie data elements into the GIS images, so there's a limited compatibility between converting maps from AutoCAD into the county GIS system. Because of this, the current GIS data lacks the information and accuracy consumers are beginning to expect and require. A comprehensive remap of Placer County from the ground up utilizing recorded documents and other official documentation directly into ESRI's GIS parcel fabric will not only streamline current workflows but allow Placer County to produce data with increased accuracy. This will increase the information available to the public and result in a reduction of costly errors that impact property tax bills, land use planning, uh, public safety and evacuations and other critical decisions that depend on the accuracy of this data. Pro West and Associates has provided technical support and consulting services for the county GIS system for several years. The firm is also considered one of the preeminent experts in system implementation of the ESRI software platform and providing professional level training on how to use the product. This assessor solicited a proposal from ProWest to convert its current maps to the county GIS system. ProWest's proposal includes detailed development of the data elements required for the conversion, consideration for any third-party integration, full conversion services for all maps, and detailed training for county staff. This project is estimated to take approximately 36 months to complete with the total cost for ProWest services being a maximum of $2,269,000. Payments will be made at a designated project milestone over the course of the project, which will span across four fiscal years. The, this award exceeds the purchasing manager's authority and requires your board's approval. Uh, with that, we're requesting the following actions for approval. I'll just read those. One, to approve a fiscal year 2023 to 24 budget amendment, AM00919, to increase appropriations for CC03001, 
assessor in the amount of $60,273 with the corresponding cancellation of general fund reserves. Number two, approve the award of a contract to Pro Weston Associates Incorporated, a Minnesota corporation for GIS parcel mapping services, including upgrades to database system and software suite in the maximum amount of $2,269,000. Three, to authorize change orders up to an aggregate amount of $100,000 consistent with the Placer County procurement policy. And four, authorize the purchasing manager to sign all required documents subject to county council and risk management concurrence. Thank you, now I'll bring it back to the board um, if we're available for any questions that you might have. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none, is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? All righty, thank you. We will go ahead and bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval. I'll second. <clears throat> Moved by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor? It, okay, this is a roll call. Please uh, <laughs> call the roll. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Holmes? Aye. Thank you. The item is moved. Thank you. Good job. We're going to move quickly to item... Um, Timed item, 11 a.m. timed item. Uh, this is County Executive, the primary indigent services contract with Kukul and Associates Incorporated. Amanda, Amanda Flo. Got it. Right Perfect. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of your board, Mrs. Schwab, Mr. Chatney. I'm Amanda Flo, Management Analyst in the County Executive Office. Joined here today with Dan Kokal, your primary public defender. We are here before you today to request your approval to enter a four-year contract with Kokal & Associates for primary indigent defense services. Today I'll be giving you a brief introduction of the program and then I will turn it over to Dan to highlight his successes over the last contract cycle, as well as talk briefly about some of his challenges. The Constitution of the United States and California statutory provisions guarantee the right to legal representation for those facing criminal charges, juvenile delinquency, and other matters for any person who is not financially able to retain counsel. And in California, the responsibility for providing and funding legal representation for those who cannot afford counsel falls to each individual county. California's 58 counties meet this responsibility through a variety of service delivery models, including County departments, where the attorneys and support staff are salaried public employees, contract public defenders, which we have in Placer, where private sector law firms or sole practitioners serve as independent contractors to the county, or assigned counsel, where cases are assigned directly by the court and are paid either a flat fee per case or on an hourly basis. Due to the high costs associated with operating a county department, many counties elect to contract with law firms from the private sector for those who are not financially able to retain defense services. Placer County has provided its primary defense services through a contract model since June of 1971. This service delivery model continues to ensure constitutionally required, efficient, and effective public defense services. Following an extensive RFP process led by the County Executive Office in the Superior Court, a four-year contract for prim primary public defender services was, was was um, awarded to Kokel and Associates that expired in June 2020. Subsequently, the county negotiated an additional four-year contract with Kokel and Associates, which expired June 30th, 2024, which is next June. Approximately six months ago, the public defender met with the county executive staff and raised several emerging, emerging issues, which include recruitment attention issues, increased workload associated with time-intensive review of body-worn camera footage and other technology-based evidentiary materials, increased requirements for clients with mental health or conservative ship cases, and increased staffing needs associated with increased caseloads and superior court coverage. Upon further analysis and discussion with the superior court, staff felt supported revising the contract early to ensure continuity continuity of operations. 
Negotiations ultimately resulted in a four-year agreement that includes right-sizing of salaries and benefits to improve recruitment and retention issues and will allow the office to remain competitive in the current workforce hiring market. The proposed contract has a 30% increase in year one, with subsequent increases capped annually at 3.5%. It includes the addition of four new attorneys and one social worker, and will ensure that the Public Defender's Office is able to meet the continually expanding legislative mental health and conservative ship demands for certain individuals charged with crimes, and to continue to upgrade their technology infrastructure to ensure the most efficient service delivery possible. This proposal was presented at the last Criminal Justice Policy Committee meeting attended by both Supervisor Holmes and Supervisor Jones, the Acting County Executive Officer and the Superior Court, and was met with overwhelming support. I will now turn it over to Dan to highlight some of the successes over the last contract period, as well as some of the challenges. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Chairman Holmes. Good morning. Members of the board, uh, Ms. Schwab, Mr. Chet Chattanigny. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Dan Kokal. I've worked in Placer County as a defense attorney for 36 years. Uh, six of those years as a private attorney, 30 years providing public defender services. Is this my PowerPoint? Let me give this a try. No? For those of you who haven't been to our office, we're located one mile north of the Roseville Courthouse. The office space was designed from the ground up with the goal of performing the functions of the Public Defender's Office as efficiently as possible. The 25,000 square foot office space is divided into team areas and has the atmosphere of a high-tech corporation. The office has software systems that communicate with and acquire information from the court, the district attorney's office, the probation department, and the sheriff's department. These processes run automatically, and in some cases, several times per day. The inefficiencies associated with maintaining paper files have been eliminated. We've scanned and shredded over 50,000 case files all of our open and closed files. Authorized personnel now have instant access to every case file and every document. Thousands of hours are saved using this system. Because most criminal cases now involve body-worn cameras or dash cameras, the office has created a dedicated workstation to process this media. In addition, a cluster of servers store, back up, and stream the video media to the office workstations. Currently, we're storing approximately 45,000 video files. Another automation process is the Robotex Court Appearance Reminder System. This system has dispatched over 100,000 appearance reminders and has reduced the failure, frequency of, of failures to appear by 50%. Let me shift from, from efficiency to advocacy. A healthy justice system requires litigation. While criminal cases are often negotiated to settlement, an adversarial system involves a measure of disagreement, which is best resolved by litigation. Our attorneys have a reputation of being competent and aggressive advocates and are frequently engaged in litigation. Now shifting to challenges. Our office is facing new and truly significant challenges. We're experiencing a large increase in clients struggling with mental health issues. Our sheriff recently reported that 29% of inmates in Placer County are suffering from severe mental illness. When a public defender has concerns regarding their client's mental health, the defense procedure becomes substantially more involved. As a result, our mental health court has had to double the court calendar time, and we've tripled the number of attorneys on our mental health team. One problem that keeps me awake at night is our inability to retain attorneys. This is a matter of real concern.
During the contract cycle, these last three and a half years, neighboring counties have been increasing their budgets to substantially expand their public defender staff. Within our region, there's been an increase in public defenders' budgets, averaging 45%. In contrast, our budget has increased by 9%. Sacramento County is aggressively soliciting and hiring our staff. Today, they have recruited 24 of our attorneys. We absolutely need to be in a position that allows us to retain our experienced and talented staff. Despite these challenges, our office has been able to defend our clients very successfully. During this contract cycle, the office has secured the dismissal of over 4,700 cases, and 24,000 charges. Please take a moment and note the bar position on the far right of this chart. It represents Placer County's per capita cost of providing public defender services compared to other regional offices. This chart visually underscores the efficiency of our office. In closing, I'd like to ex express my sincere gratitude for the board's long-standing support. Your trust and confidence has been instrumental in allowing our office to achieve truly remarkable things. Thank you for your support and your belief in our mission. I'll turn Thank it back you. to Ms. Law. Thank you, Dan, appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, to recap, we are here today to request your board approve and authorize the county executive officer or designee to sign a four-year contract with Cocollin Associates Incorporated for primary indigent defense services for the period of July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2028 in the total amount of $46,242,306 and to authorize the county executive officer to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $250,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work and with risk management and county council concerns, concurrence. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to also thank Dan. Thank you for your partnership, um, for your innovative ideas, your leadership, and your approaches. Uh, we truly value this um, relationship. Um, and if anyone has not had the opportunity to tour his office, um, I, I recommend you take the chance. Please reach out and we'll schedule something for you. With that, I open um, the floor for any questions. Any comments? Board members, uh, Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Just um, one quick question. I appreciate all of your hard work and certainly understand the challenge of retaining and keeping actually good attorneys who are able to do the challenging work. Um, do you have other locations that you serve or other communities that you provide public defender services for? I'm just curious. No, no. We have a satellite office up in Lake Tahoe, but just Placer County. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Gustafson. Thanks. I had, and Dan, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Stay up there. Um, I saw that the case uh, load has gone up 24%, and you gave some statistics on the number of cases. How many individuals um, does that represent in a course of an average year? About 6,000. 6,000 individuals. Wow. Yes. I wasn't sure if some of those cases were multiple with one individual, but... Well, they are, they are. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Supervisor Jones. I'd like to thank you for, for all your hard work that you, you folks do in the public defenders arena. And also to tell everybody that um, if you have an opportunity to tour that office, please do. It's quite amazing, all of the things that you do. Everything is is technologically sound, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing place. Um, so I'd highly recommend you tour if you can. And I'd like to thank you again for all your service. Thank you. I, I've toured the, your office twice and it is amazing, the work that you do <clears throat> and the amount of uh, the employees you have and their excellent, uh, excellent team. So thank you for that. Uh, anyone in the public wish to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? Already, is this a roll call? No. Okay. All right. Motion by. 
Motion by Supervisor uh, Jones, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to move to our 1025 a.m. timed item, uh, but I'm going to take a quick break, so I'll turn this over to our chair, the vice chair, just for a few minutes. Okay. okay. Good morning. On to, yes, 1025, Community Development Resource Agency. Um, take it away, Chris. Yes, good morning, Vice Chair Jones, board members, Chris Pahuli, your planning director. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this item, which is a presentation to review the Placer County Mobility and Infill Acceleration Study. I should note that there is no board action recommended today with this informational item. Uh, the board may recall that back in 2020, the county was awarded a Caltrans Sustainable uh, Communities Grant to prepare this study, uh, which evaluates and recommends infill strategies to reduce vehicle miles traveled and improve air quality in the county. Uh, so this uh, uh, study has been uh, underway for a number of years now, which we're happy to be bringing forward today. As you'll hear during the presentation, this study provides background information and policy recommendations to build upon for the uh, development of our land use and circulation elements for our in-progress general plan update. A study will also be beneficial as we make collective decisions uh, related to our various community plans, including the North Auburn Community Plan Update, which is underway. Uh, as noted in the report, some of the opportunity sites identified in this study were incorporated into our proposed housing rezone program. However, this study is informational only, uh, and those final list of properties, as the board is well aware, will be subject to a separate action uh, early 2024. Uh, today's presentation will be provided by Angel Green, lead planner for the study. We also have consultant team members here led by Bob uh, Lagomarsino, who was a prime consultant in pre uh, preparing the study. Uh, with that, I'll hand the reins of the presentation over to uh, Ms. Angel Green. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's see, I'm going to time myself. I was hoping to wrap this up in 15 minutes, but I'll see if I can summarize it a little bit quicker given our time constraints today. Uh, so thank you, uh, members of the board, uh, CEO and uh, County Council. My name is Angel Green, Senior Planner with the Planning Services Division. And I'll be providing an overview, as Chris mentioned, of the Placer County Mobility and Infill Acceleration Study. I may refer to this study as the MIAS report, the MIAS project, uh, just in short. So I first would like to introduce, Chris had mentioned uh, that uh, the board had entered into um, uh, a contract with Lago Marasino and planning, uh, but there were actually a number of folks that helped participate uh, during the development of this study that I'd like to briefly introduce, shall the board have any technical questions that we need to have answered. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Bob Lago Marasino with Lago Marasino and planning and management. We also have from Green Dot Transportation Solutions, we have Jeff Schwinn and Nathaniel Redman, who are in-house today. Uh, Catherine Hansford with Hansford Economic and Consulting. Uh, she was online for a short time, but uh, she may have had to have stepped off. Uh, and then also we had a number of county staff that helped to develop uh, the study and oversaw the development of it. So I'd like to just share that uh, we've got planning staff uh, as well as Katie Jackson from our DBW department. All right, so as Chris mentioned, uh, this effort here was funded as part of a uh, competitive grant that the county was successful in obtaining in June of 2020. Uh, that was through the Caltrans Sustainable Communities Grant Program. And that program aims to promote sustainability, increasing mobility and safety, also increasing safety benefits or rather health benefits, and social equity within the communities in California. In August of 2020, this board took action to enter into a contract with Caltrans to fund this MIAS report uh, and to bring our Lago Marcino uh, consulting team on board to help with the development of the study. 
brief overview of the MIAS. Uh, this study is focused on five infill opportunity areas within the unincorporated areas of the county. It includes an evaluation of how potential land use and transportation or mobility strategies can influence vehicle miles traveled or VMT and provide and ways to provide air quality benefits, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, as well as other community benefits in various settings. In this study, the project team examined the relationship between land use development and travel behavior. For each of these areas, we investigated various factors, including population density, the diversity and design of development, a balance between jobs and housing, and how aspects like mobility, accessibility, connectivity, and transportation choices can play a pivotal role in shaping land use development. The theoretical basis of the study aims to determine under what scenarios certain areas of the county can support more diverse development while also allowing for mobility enhancements that will allow the public to choose alternative transportation modes. Also, how development can occur in a way that reduces the rate of VMT, both for households as well as workplace-related travel. The report concludes with policy recommendations to realize the benefits uh, that are shown in the study and also will help to inform policy development during the general plan and community plan updates and this includes the Auburn Bowman Community Plan, which is currently underway. In order to understand the relationship between land use and travel behavior, the project team developed three mobility scenarios. The first scenario applies a modest level of infrastructure and mobility improvements, whereas scenario two applies higher infrastructure coupled with more progressive mobility improvements and programs less constrained by funding opportunities. And for our two North Auburn areas, we have a third scenario that was also considered uh, to look at additional residential land use inputs. So a total of five infill opportunity areas were selected. Uh, they were based on factors such as low VMT for the area, housing opportunities, transit accessibility, and gaps in active transportation infrastructure. The study area includes Bell Road and Luther Road, both in North Auburn. We have Newcastle, Penryn Parkway and Penryn, as well as Granite Bay. Visions expressed in community plans were taken in, into account. Compatibility plans where density limits and other development restrictions app uh, may apply were also accounted for. As Chris mentioned, potential housing opportunity sites that were identified in the county's housing element and housing needs rezone program uh, were also considered. And last, I want to mention that also we wanted to account for previous development applications that may have been received on some of these parcels uh, and also accounting for market interests. So I will provide an overview of each of the five infill opportunity areas, and I'll just briefly mention just some of the projects given our time constraints today. I, I won't go into do too much detail, but happy to answer any questions that may come up. So the first here, we have the Bell Road in uh, North Auburn, and I like to highlight here the land use scenarios that were considered in the analysis, as well as the mobility recommendations provided in the report. So starting with Bell Road, as we see, we have six land use scenarios that were considered, uh, including a range of commercial, office, and residential land use types. Uh, in the North Auburn uh, Bell Road, north of Bell Road, sorry about that, uh, we also wanted to look at you know, the, the constraints as well as opportunities for each of these areas. And so here we have the Auburn Municipal Airport, which presents uh, a few challenges and constraints, uh, including limitations on housing and density that we wanted to account for. But also we have opportunities within the area and unique land use uh, drivers that are associated with the airport in terms of land use. Uh, and uh, we also have a strong retail uh, corridor that we wanted to account for. 
Around the Bell Road intersection and to the south, uh, the challenge is to continue to diversify development in ways that will lead to a better balance between residential uses and employment and commercial uses. And so the recommendations that are provided in the report for each of our key opportunity areas intend to address this challenge. I'll mention also that most of these sites in the area fall within compatibility zone C under the Auburn Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan, which restricts the type and density of development, including multifamily residential land uses. And these are the types of restrictions that I had mentioned that we did account for uh, as we developed the various scenarios for each of the study areas. There are exceptions within the compatibility plan uh, that do allow for mixed use and multifamily use if the project or the parcel rather is located or has been listed on the county's designated infill green zone and that would be areas west of Highway 49. Uh, so we did include those sites, uh, as well as sites that were identified in the county's housing element rezone list. For the mobility recommendations, uh, you'll see here that for the North Auburn Opportunity Areas, the key objective is to create more pedestrian and bicycle connections, uh, which is a challenge uh, because of the scale and the character of Highway 49 and Bell Road to some degree as well. From a transit perspective, continued expansion or restoration of bus routes and services is also key for North Auburn, as well as expansion of uh, micro transit services. And here in North Auburn, we have the Auburn On Demand program, which some might not be aware of. For Luther, we have five sites that are listed. Uh, and these were based on, again, the availability of vacant and underutilized sites. I'm uh, not going to go into too much detail here, but I do uh, just want to mention that uh, we did see a number of challenges here in terms of uh, suitable uh, opportunities for land use and development. Uh, you know, would we consider man-made features such as the railroad tracks, we've got the canals, uh, but there's also some natural features that we had to account for as well. Uh, sites are also subject to the Auburn uh, Airport compatibility plan, uh, but they fall within compatibility zone D. So there were uh, a little bit uh, more options that we were able to apply under our scenario development that included multifamily residential. For the mobility section, uh, you know, we looked at the connectivity needs uh, that are similar to Bell Road. Uh, it also looked at specific opportunities uh, to address in these areas. Transit recommendations um, are essentially the same as those for Bell Road. All right, so for Newcastle, we have three sites that were identified. Um, there uh, were very few parcels uh, that we were able to find that um, really fit the sort of definition of infill. Uh, but we had three sites that we thought might work along the edge of the historic uh, community area. All of these do provide opportunities that could address demand for types of development not otherwise uh, supplied in the area. This could include the missing middle housing uh, that's emphasized in the county's housing element. Uh, all properties are also located conveniently uh, near the historic route of Newcastle uh, and could provide an opportunity for uh, providing support for the existing commercial uses. I'll also just mention that it, it is noted in the study that this is the only one of uh, the infill opportunity areas that's not covered by a community plan. And so with the general plan update, uh, we do have an opportunity there uh, to consider how to address Newcastle in the uh, sub-area planning process. The new uh, Castle area does present some challenges also with uh, expanding pedestrian and uh, bicycle improvements. Uh, the study does include a number of strategies and makes note of those existing, uh, in existing plans such as the Placer County's bikeway plan that would be beneficial for the area. Uh, and maybe even perhaps uh, a potential pilot project that could subsidize on-demand shuttle services. For Penryn, uh, the land use and development recommendations for the key sites in this area were derived from the intensification and diversification that were anticipated under the Penryn Parkway designation for the community plan for that area. Uh, and we do have some sites also that were listed in the housing element that were considered in our uh, assumptions and scenarios. 
For mobility, the recommendations for the Penryn Parkway, uh, they're relatively modest just due to the um, general uh, rural nature of the area. Uh, but they do include establishing a bicycle and pedestrian uh, pathway along natural corridors uh, that might be more comfortable uh, than what we have on, on Penryn Road, which is rather busy. Uh, but could also and, and maybe uh, should consider uh, more moto multimodal capacity and provide better connections between the north and the south sides of I-80. And then last, moving on to Granite Bay. So for the land use uh, scenarios, uh, this area was selected in part because the Granite Bay Community Plan identifies this area as a, a candidate for the creation of a vibrant mixed use uh, central area in the otherwise suburban residential community. All three sites represent uh, possibilities for complementing recent projects uh, that are also uh, consistent with this vision. The general plan update process will include an opportunity to reaffirm the vision uh, for Douglas Boulevard and Auburn Folsom Road, and we intend to do that as we uh, make progress in that area. And we do have, there was one site that was listed on the housing element rezone site. That was the Auburn Folsom Road site. And in terms of mobility, again, uh, similar to the other areas, uh, there were recommendations that uh, were made for improving and expanding bicycle and pedestrian uh, connections with the adjacent uses. Here we were looking specifically at Folsom Lake, state recreational area, being able to bridge uh, and provide some more safety options for recreational uh, folks that uh, like to engage in recreational uh, bike riding. That was one of the comments that we got from the planning, or rather the, uh, the MAC meeting out there. Uh, and let's see, uh, many of the strategies that were listed in the regional uh, bikeway plan, uh, there's also a note made there as to where we can expand there. And then I'll just mention last uh, that the transportation uh, recommendations also respond to the fact that there's currently no transit service in the area. So there are some strategies listed on how best to address uh, those opportunities. All right, so moving on to the countywide recommendations, uh, in addition to the mobility recommendations, the report also provides a list of countywide policy recommendations uh, that staff intend to consider during our general plan and community plan updates. Uh, and so there are a number of those that are provided in the report. I have a few listed here. And just due to time, I might just highlight one that I know uh, has been a question for this board before on other uh, types of projects uh, that deal with infrastructure uh, capacity. And so we know that one of the impediments to infill development is the limited infra infrastructure capacity, uh, which we have in many areas of the county. So that was something that we wanted to make note of. Uh, the general plan update will provide uh, the opportunity to evaluate the capacity of existing systems uh, to accommodate new development, uh, both in greenfield and our infill uh, settings. This evaluation will complement the county's ongoing participation in SACOG's Green Means Go program, uh, which will help to identify opportunities to compete for state funding necessary to support the infrastructure improvements in these areas where current facilities and services are insufficient to support more intense infill development. The report does provide uh, a quantitative analysis to determine the potential VMT and GHG emission reductions that would result from the mobility options that were analyzed under the scenarios. The report indicates uh, that by accelerating the pace of infill development, uh, implementing VMT reduction strategies uh, will further amplify the VMT and GHG uh, reductions in these areas. It's also worth mentioning, though, that the study does demonstrate that the type and location of land development can also have a beneficial effect on VMT, uh, and in many instances can provide more of a reduction compared to any of the available mitigation measures. While VMT mitigation measures like bike and pedestrian infrastructure and transit service can help, the choice of land use and project location is most effective, especially when we consider the costs of some of these infrastructure improvements. It's also important to note 
that future land use development projects within, within these areas are likely to have a less than significant VMT impact when analyzed under CEQA. Uh, therefore, the mobility improvements that are described in this study would not necessarily be required as mitigation measures. And as a result, the county would have to rely on other sources of funding to support uh, to achieve the vision of these scenarios. The study also includes a comprehensive analysis of air pollution costs that are associated with the emissions from uh, mobile uh, sources. And it shows that the combination of land use and mobility changes uh, can benefit the community, both by improving air quality and enabling healthier travel choices. All right, so as I conclude my presentation, I did just want to share some of the outreach efforts. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we did start in 20, mid-2020, uh, but we've got a, a dedicated web page. Uh, we did some surveys to seek uh, public comment uh, in areas where, uh, in ways that the county might be able to reduce VMT. Uh, and then we also partnered with our partners at PCWA on a joint uh, workshop. We did bring the, uh, the study forward early on in the process to each of uh, the MACs uh, for the areas that were being studied. And we did receive some in various input uh, from both the community and MAC members. And a summary of that uh, feedback is provided in your report. There's a few flyers that we had put together, one in English, one in Spanish. All right, and that brings me to then the planning commission item. We did take this forward on uh, November 9th as an information item. Here are just a few of the questions that were brought up by the commission. Uh, and I did just want to highlight just a few here. Uh, there was a question as to whether or not the study aligned with uh, existing permitted applications. Uh, that certainly is the case. Uh, in fact, many of the scenarios looked at previous development applications to be able to gauge what the developer's interests as well as market demands uh, were for these areas. There was also a question related to the housing rezoning uh, project and how this study sort of aligned with uh, the relationship to the housing element. So as I mentioned, and as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, most of our scenarios, in fact, I think all of them in the areas where we had sites that were identified as part of the, the housing elements uh, rezone list, those were considered as uh, part of our scenario development. All right. Um, I think with that, uh, I, I wanted to, to open up the opportunity to, to answer questions, um, but I did fail to miss, and, and Chris, I failed to bring to your attention wherever he is. Oh, there you are. We do actually have an action item that was added at the last minute to the staff report, and that's just to find that the project is not subject to CEQA. So uh, I, I don't want to forget that before we conclude. Uh, but with that, I'd like to hear any questions, uh, see if I might be able to answer any that you might have. And again, we do uh, have our, our consulting Super team. Supervisor available. Jones, your light is on. Did you have a oh, I'm very exception? sorry. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> any other questions, comments, or board members? Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you, Angel, and, and thanks <clears throat> to the team for your hard work over the last couple of years on this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the public is confused, as sometimes our supervisors are, too, at least one, <laughs> um, on the overlay of this with the rezone project. And obviously, the need for the rezone came up after you had already commenced this work. The concern about um, really focusing on infill and not on going out into our rural communities and trying to establish more high-density housing that doesn't have jobs nearby. So really looking at the drivers of how we, literally drivers, um, of how we uh, place housing in alignment with commercial or, or job-related growth is critical. And trying to explain this to the public when we have these two processes on two workshops on a week apart in our board meeting has been challenging. Um, so any wisdom you can share as to how we approach this item in conjunction with our rezone item, and I'll look to, to maybe Chris on this one, because I think we, we have um, a lot of explaining to do to the, the public of how these yeah. are going to interact. 
Yeah, I think as you correctly pointed out, this, this effort has been underway since 2020. Um, our housing element was adopted in 2021 along with a number of candidate rezone sites. So we've been working for a few years on trying to refine that list and get it ready for action. It just so happens that these uh, two items are, are coinciding from a timing standpoint. Uh, this project with the um, award from Caltrans uh, needs to come to its conclusion given the grant and the contractual relationships we have with the state. Um, I do think that there are, even though that there, there are opportunity sites that were identified as part of this study, um, and those do in some instances correspond with some of the areas that were studied both in the housing element and with our candidate rezone list, uh, there's broad applicability with this study to other areas of the county, even though those might be outside of the opportunity areas that have been have been looked at. And so, again, this is a, a study. It'll help inform as we work on our general plan update and perhaps some of the community plans as well and provides broad application for infill strategies, not just in those opportunity areas, but throughout the county where we might find some opportunities to encourage infill development. But again, it is um, a bit unfortunate that the timing of these, um, you know, line up when there's going to need to be some decisions made on the um, on the rezone to meet our housing element rezone list. Well, thank you, and I, and I appreciate that. I think um, looking at reductions of VMT require jobs and housing to be located close together, yep. and so how we how we analyze even our rezone when we come back for the workshop there and um, these opportunity sites is gonna be critical to our community to see how we're looking at that um, in conjunction because nothing ever aligns perfectly in this world, especially when the state of California gets involved. So um, how, we, how we make it align for our county residents and make um, the arguments that are needed to uh, gain support for whatever initiatives we take is going to be critical. So I appreciate all the work staff has done on this. In and of itself, this is great, but, you know, piggybacking on a week uh, past and the comments we heard, and we heard again in public comment this morning from a lot of those hit by some of those sites, um, uh, it's critical for our, we as a board to set policy that makes sense in VMT reduction and climate goals, so thank you. Thank you, any other comments from board members? Uh, Supervisor Jones. Yes, thank you, um, Asia, great, great report. Could you go back to the um, granite Bay slide? Sure. sure. <clears throat> I have two slides. We have the land use scenarios and then we have the mobility recommendations. Um, we'll go ahead to the mobility. But first, I want to start out with um, each of those parcels look like they're the same exact parcels that were identified for rezoning. They, they, they are. So, so I'm, I'm confused. Uh, I, I did miss the board meeting where we talked about the, uh, those projects. How are we going to, are they going to be infill or are they going to be automatically rezoned to 20 to 30? Units, no. living units per acre. Yeah, so, so the, um, at, during the work, workshop hearing, um, there was direction provided from the board to remove the sites that were not interested in participating. Um, my recollection is that the uh, property shown as property one are, no, are not interested in participating in the rezone, so those, those have been removed. Okay. Uh, the others will be um, uh, open for consideration at, at a later date when this gets brought back. Um, we're targeting a end of January, early February date um, for the board to have further consideration okay. about, about those. Um, having said that, these are infill sites, right? So even if number one isn't a candidate site for a rezone to multifamily residential, there are certainly opportunities for infill development there. Um, we've been uh, meeting with uh, interested parties on that site. They're um, looking at additional commercial development there. So uh, irrespective of residential development or not, they are 
they continue to be infill opportunity sites. Okay, okay. So if you look down on um, two and three, two is to prioritize the proposed bike network um, recommended in the Placer County Regional Bikeway Plan. Do you know what that is? And then they're also talking about providing a buffered bike lane from from Auburn Folsom Road along Douglas, but to where? From Auburn Folsom, which way? Towards the lake or towards? It was towards the lake, if I remember correctly. Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were looking at some recreational because we already have we already have a separated trail or bike lane, except for uh, very close to the intersection. We just got funding to finish it from um, the east side of, of, of Auburn Folsom Road up and over the hill. But the funding that we secured, the good news is we secured the funding. The bad news is we're not going to be able to get it built until 2026. So, so it kind of, for me, this is in conflict with what's happening in DPW um, as far as bike lanes. Well, we've got parks with bike lanes. We've got DPW with, so I'm just wondering, how are you guys all communicating? Katie is going to come up and speak to that. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon. Katie Jackson with the Department of Public Works. Um, so those two facilities could exist together. So we could have an on-street bike lane uh, along Douglas Boulevard towards the lake for those who are comfortable riding on the, on the street with their bike. We could also have the multi-use path to the side where we have um, both pedestrians and possibly bicyclists, depending on the width of the facility. Um, but I think that the uh, path that you're talking about is primarily for pedestrians, whereas the on-street facilities would be primarily for bicyclists. So this amounts to just a bike lane? Yeah, I think the, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, the uh, Placer County Regional Bikeway Plan identifies a buffered bike lane, which okay. has a little bit of space between the cars and the bike lane, and it's an on-street facility versus okay. what we're constructing on the north side of Douglas, which is um, an off-street facility. And I believe we're we're looking at a more like a sidewalk for that. Okay, so that it'll be it will be separated from the traffic because it's right. a little bit hilly in there. Yes, and that's what concerns people is that cars don't see things before they come up and over the hill. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then, can we go back to um, slide number seven? There you go. Scenario one, include moderate infrastructure improvements, and that seems to include intersection improvements, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, public transit accessibility. Um, one issue I'm concerned about is we really don't have a very good sewer infrastructure in Granite Bay because a large percentage of my constituents are on septic. So if we bring all of this infill with higher density, um, don't we have to prepare that kind of sewer infrastructure as well? Which from my friends in DPW is very <laughs> expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's a little outside my yeah. yeah, so any uh, land use development projects that would come through would need to go through the required CEQA analysis that would look at the constraints on those types of infrastructure improvements. Uh, and start, unfortunately, this study was very much focused just on mobility and transportation enhancements and those types of infrastructure needs. Uh, but again, being able to show where you can gain a reduction in VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, we know that the state is motivated to provide assistance uh, with either studies or uh, infrastructure improvements in those areas. SACOG's uh, Green Means Go uh, program would be a, a fine example of that. And if we're able to show under various scenarios that, you know, one scenario may be able to provide some additional VMT reduction, hence then the, the GHG and air quality benefits, uh, our hope is that we're better positioning the county at obtaining grant funding that can help facilitate some of the construction of these other improvements that are going to be necessary for infill development. Okay. And then my last comment would be, I'm not sure how we're going to reduce vehicle miles traveled um, particularly in that area, we have one grocery store on the northwest corner of Douglas and Auburn Folsom. 
we have two gas stations and that's it. So anybody who lives there is gonna to have to travel either to Folsom, Roseville, or even Sacramento, whether it's shopping or, or um, seeking jobs. So that's, there's really, it'll, however many people we add in those areas, it's not gonna reduce VMTs, it's gonna increase them. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. And, and it was something that we considered in our uh, development of our scenarios, looking at uh, mixed use that includes a commercial component uh, for each of these. And uh, for that Northwest corner, uh, we were looking at uh, under that scenario commercial or high density right uh, but you know being able to bring houses closer to services and services closer to housing that's right. definitely a, a critical point uh, that's needed if we're going to reduce vmt right which we really lack in granite bay in fact on the corner there well not really on the corner but um on the east side of um, auburn folsom and douglas we have the shopping center in there as and the same with the quarry ponds on douglas both of those, the businesses struggle, and we have a high rate of turnover because a large amount of traffic that travels Auburn Folsom Road and then onto Douglas is commuter traffic between Folsom and Roseville. We carry between 40 to 50,000 cars on those two roadways daily, and most of them are commuters, and they do not stop in quarry ponds. They do not stop to shop because they're going from work to home. Yeah. And that's their, that's their goal. So, I mean, those are some things I think need to be considered about the Granite Bay area when we talk about adding infill and high-density housing and everything. Well, we do plan to revisit it for sure as part of our general plan update, so more to come on that for sure. Great. Thank you, Angel. Appreciate it. Very good. Any more questions? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Angel, can you go back to slide 11, please? <clears throat> I'm interested in that Bohemia site. That's off of Canal Street. Is that off Luther and Canal? Yes. Uh, it was uh, actually planned to have a Walmart there. Is that the site? Yes, that's Does the Walmart one. Does Walmart still own that property? Do you know? I think they've... I don't know it. who owns it, but I know they've withdrawn their application. Um, yeah, I knew they did that, yeah. but I think they bought the property just to put it... So we wouldn't let anybody else in there. I, I, I don't know if that's... Do you know what the status of that? I know Bob looked into some... Did own it. They did. Walmart, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. I, I don't know of any recent transactions. Okay. Recent information. Right. Yeah, we'd have to find that out because it's an exec excellent site for infill housing. That yes. If, if uh, Walmart doesn't want to give it up or give it to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's something that we did note within our study. It's an interesting and it's a challenging site given yeah. some of the previous uses. Uh, and so we did work through uh, different scenarios yeah. that I think could work for that site. And there's also a canal there that has a narrow bridge that has to be, and that's where you have to go through the uh, FERC relicensing program in order to even do yes. that. So it's probably in, uh, unavailable. Problematic. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address Mr. Nader? <clears throat> Wayne Nader, uh, Chairman Holmes, board members, uh, Aaron and Daniel. Um, again, I want to always say that I am a strong proponent of affordable housing and workforce housing. Do we need uh, affordable housing and workforce housing in North Auburn? Absolutely, we do. I think anytime we're considering it, it's uh, is the location appropriate? Are the concentrations of that type of housing appropriate? I mean, obviously, infrastructure is kind of the, one of the first things you look at. And as I consider North Auburn, uh, we do have an impediment to that to some degree. It's certainly Highway 49. 49 is what it is. There, I think we can agree there's not much more we can do to it. I was glad to see what Caltrans did in the last couple of years where they timed the lights now. Anybody who's used 49 can find that we they're less stopping at the lights. There's more flow to it, which is great. But it's still, we have a lot of traffic backed up at times on 49. And to add uh, 20 or 30 units to an acre on some of these properties, you're going to concentrate more traffic. I love the idea of less people using uh, vehicles, but it's really, really hard to separate people from their vehicles. Uh, so I think uh, it's optimistic to think that you can actually lower those VMT issues. But um, I would, I know there, it's an overlapping, I know there's confusion as you brought up about the rezoning 
and, uh, and this, but there are overlapping issues here. And I think that we need to really focus on being um, really cautious as to where we do these things. And I have an issue with trying to do them in rural areas. You've all brought that up as an issue that where are the jobs? Where's the public services? Where uh, can they get access uh, to any, just basic needs that would get them out of their vehicles? And I don't, th I don't think that really works in these rural areas. So I, I like some of the discussion we had earlier of how we could try to work with the other cities because, boy, does it make sense to put them there. There's where your job centers are. There's where your public services are. If we can somehow integrate that into what our needs are, great. Because uh, I just think, again, trying to force this into North Auburn or Newcastle or Bowman or down into Penryn just uh, has some real challenges to it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. <clears throat> Any other comments from uh, the audience? <clears throat> Is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, supervisors. I, I concur the lack of jobs is, is really a problem, um, for Granite Bay at least. Um, and the uh, I, I actually got information from, from the engineering manager on um, the traffic. And the last traffic study in Granite Bay was in 2012. There is a plethora of activities that Stephanie Holloway did, and nothing has come from that. The city of Roseville has requested anything on Douglas. <clears throat> Any major development was supposed to trigger six lanes um, because the traffic is backing up into Roseville. Um, it seems like we're doing things even though there's two programs, why are we not updating the traffic um, circulation element in the, the general and community plans before we do our HNA rezones? It doesn't make sense to cram the zoning infill in and then do the traffic studies. We also don't have any um, level of service. I know that we've gone to VMT, and I, I agree with the Supervisor Jones that VMT is going to increase. It's not going to decrease uh, by a comparison model. Um, the the looking at the um, the infill there, the level of service at several of the uh, major intersections along Douglas and Auburn Folsom were E and F. This was years ago. So to not do a study, cram more zoning in, and then do a, a study update seems a little backwards to me, regardless of when the programs were implemented. We knew about the um, RHNA rezone in 2020. The the it went to the state and then they had to approve it, but it just seems like we're not uh, we're doing things a little bit uh, backwards. I think our our community plan already planned for high density areas, and so without the infrastructure, if infrastructure is a problem, why aren't we not tackling the infrastructure for the projected growth before we do any um, rezones? We've already gone through two. Uh, community plan updates, the last one in 2012, and we believe we have a good community plan. So I think uh, the infrastructure should be done first. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cheryl. Anyone else? Yes, Chairman. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, thank you. Pam Asai here again. My, I have a few questions about the presentation. Um, my first uh, question is, um, and I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up. Uh, my concern is for um, the um, overspill lighting that occurs when building happens on like Newcastle sites one, two, and three. And um, how does that get addressed? Like, is that way down the road? So that's my first comment. My second comment and question is, um, you know, I hear about the interest in um, uh, improving or increasing bike trails on Folsom Lake. Um, I, those kind of bike trails really don't reduce greenhouse emissions. Um, those are for 
recreation. So um, I don't know if by putting in bike trails, you know, it, it gives the appearance of reducing emissions, but it certainly doesn't. Um, and then my other concern is that in increasing the um, usage of bikes and increasing bike trails on Folsom Lake um, has any um, discussion or concern um, or attention been um, focused on maintaining pro and protecting the equestrian use trails and any insurance of um, maintaining the safety of those trails. Um, I personally um, encountered a bicyclist uh, on a bike trail coming around a blind corner at approximately uh, 25 miles an hour and um, uh, almost ran into my horse. My horse threw me. Um, I then was stepped on my chest by another horse and received uh, four fractured ribs and a cardiac contusion. I was told I was lucky to be alive. Um, so I have a real vested interest in, um, you know, maintaining the safety of those trails and um, not increasing the um, number of bike trails at Folsom Lake. There are plenty. I feel like uh, that group has a very strong uh, lobby component and so um, has a very strong voice and um, it's to the detriment and the danger uh, to other users, pedestrians and equestrians. Um, I think that's it. I did want those important points to be noted, particularly the lighting, my location on um, in Penryn. Um, I, um, there's constantly um, spotlights being put up all along Indian Hill Road, all along that ridge. And um, there's significant light pollution. I don't see this, I don't see stars anymore. Um, no, I won't go any more into that subject other than to say, I really hope that it's addressed with new construction that um, we do something like other areas have done who value um, what they have, such as like Hawaii, you know, there's restriction on lighting. Um, other areas in the Bay Area restrict lighting on ridges. Um, and there's a general um, civility in those communities that seems um, to be um, declining here with our increase of population from bigger cities. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Anyone else? Yes, speaker, please go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hello, this is Donna Delno from Pedrin, 23 year resident, always fighting to keep our lifestyle the same as mostly when we moved here. But I wanna make sure I can continue to say that the zones that you're looking to rezone or change in Penryn, when you count up the number of units proposed, you're gonna to need to figure that there's probably two cars per unit and they all need to drive to a job somewhere. Cause last I looked, Penryn probably has 80 or 90 jobs. That's Penryn school and some of the ranches, a couple of the markets, the VC. Uh, there's not that many jobs around here. So these people all have to get in a car and drive. So the VMTs for anything in Penryn is going to be at least 20 miles, you know, one way and back or 20 miles one way to get there 15 or 20 miles away. So I just want you to reconsider that all of the infrastructure should be put in first and these affordable units and high density housing needs to be next to Sierra College next to Target, you know, somewhere where people can hop on a bus or ride their bike over to do things. But when you put it in the middle of a rural town, you have to use your car to get anywhere. And um, I always feel the reports don't accurately describe the amount of impact that we're going to face on every level, including schools, the fire department. Do we even have a fire truck that can reach three stories tall with some of these things being proposed? So Again, I'll continue to fight because I want to make sure it makes sense um, that the high density, you know, affordable units, whatever we want to call them, they have to be near the jobs to have less impact on our roads. And then we have to have room in the schools. 
So that's all. I'll keep speaking up. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Donna. Any other public comments? Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Thank you. Mike Garabedian again, Placer County tomorrow and Pacific to American Divide. Uh, this is uh, one more example of what Placer County does really well, which is to encourage landowners to develop. Uh, you might say it's a development wolf in, in transportation sheep's clothing, uh, or just a, another speed up. We had a 19 day Mac blitz just, uh, just noted here, and I, I managed to get to one of those Mac meetings on this. Uh, but I think the best way I could sum it up is to say that what I see going on, how it looks to me, is that you, Placer County, wants to become like Sacramento County. In fact, that's where you hired planning from, Sacramento County. This is, this is where we seem to be heading with this. Um, it's really misleading, uh, but it's also something that, that could use uh, some CEQA ahead of time. But most of all, some common sense and a change in the direction from planning and development at all costs to put it and doing all these things one, two, three at a time before as part of leading up to the uh, pl a new general plan. So in other words, there are maybe half a dozen things already in motion that will lead to the general plan and then public comes along later. Not very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Anyone else? One last one. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi again, it's Patty Neifer and Penryn. Um, I, I only had the benefit of listening about half the presentation, but I really want to appreciate that Supervisor Gustafson did make the point, point out the conflicts, um, the conflict between the VMT and then the high density housing areas that have no services and no jobs. And I agree, the county does have some explaining to do and so does, does the planning department. And I think it's really hard to explain because it doesn't make any sense. It's not common sense. So the vehicle miles traveled hasn't been considered as part of the high density housing or the infill. And I don't understand why not. So this is just one more example of the county trying to follow state requirements and reducing vehicle miles traveled, but doing exactly the opposite because of a conflicting mission of increasing the density of the housing. It's just so glaringly conflicting. I don't know how that's going to be um, explained. And that's my comment. Thank you, Patty. No further comments, Chairman. All righty. So this is a, um, this is a, yeah, just information. It's a workshop, so. Pardon? Yeah, there, there was, as Ms. Green mentioned during the, during the presentation, there was one requested item, and that is uh, included in your agenda packet. Uh, it says to determine that the proposed action is not a project subject to uh, oh. Section 15378 of the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines. Right. Uh, as point of clarification, what exactly is the proposed action that would require this? There is none. There's no project here. Right. And this is an informational item. So I think Correct. my point is I'm not sure why we're doing a CEQA uh, determination on simply an informational presentation to the board. Sure, I defer to county council on this. Thanks. Good, thank you. <clears throat> so any other final comments before I close the item? See then, thank you, the item is uh, finished. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lagomarsino. Just wanted to say the name, it's. <laughs> well done. Uh, yes, but I can't say the name. <laughs> Not because it's a secret. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, work on it. I am working. Okay. Where are we? Item seven now? Yeah. And was there a supplemental action? Not until 10? 7B? So it's not 7B. Thanks for the clarification. <clears throat>
All right, now we'll move to item seven. This is a department item from Health and Human Services. Agreement with Advocates for Mentally Ill Housing Incorporated for Supportive Housing at Sunrose Apartments. You're not Amy Ellis. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Good afternoon, Honorable Board, Chair Holmes, Vice Chair Jones. My name is Aaron Cadorn. I'm a Housing Manager for the Adult System of Care Division within the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, this afternoon, I bring an item regarding permanent supportive housing services provided by AMI Housing. I just wanted to point out a few things. First, um, this contract is related to the $23.5 million Home Key 2 award that we received from the state's Department of Housing and Community Development in April 2022. Uh, that was actually a competitive grant. Second thing I wanted to mention is that Sunrose Apartments will house and support uh, 82 chronically homeless Placer County residents that would otherwise be difficult to house and keep housed. Also, AMI Housing has brought additional funding to the project including Roseville Housing Authority vouchers, state funding for rental subsidies, and both federal funds and vouchers. And also with the discussion from this morning, um, I thought it was worth noting that, you know, we did carefully consider uh, the siting and location of the project. Um, and we recognize that, you know, if it were going to be in um, a, a deeply suburban area, that would be problematic on, on multiple fronts. Um, and if it were located in a deeply rural area, um, that would also present um, some of its challenges. So um, we did give consideration to, um, you know, siting and location uh, around the time of the acceptance of the award. And so with that, I have a two-part requested action for the board this morning. Uh, first, approve an agreement with Advocates for Mentally Ill Housing mm -hmm. Incorporated for supportive housing at Sunrose Apartments in an amount not to exceed $5,083,068 from January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2026, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign any subsequent amendments not to exceed $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And then secondly, uh, find that the action is exempt from environmental review pursuant to Section 15301 of the California Environmental Quality Act. Of course, I'm available for any comments or questions. All righty, thank you. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience who wish to address this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? Okay, we'll close the public comment on this and bring it back for action. I'll move approval. I'll second. Moved by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions, the item is moved. Thank you for your time and your Thank patience. You. I appreciate it. Now we'll move to item eight on our department items, Procurement Debt Collection Services State of California Franchise Tax Board. You got me, you got me up here. All right, good afternoon, yeah, uh, Chair good. Holmes, Honorable Board, Ms. Schwab, Mr. Chatney. Um, name is Ben Bramer. I'm your acting purchasing manager. I'm here requesting your board's approval to award a negotiated agreement to the State of California Franchise Tax Board Court Ordered Debit Collections Program for Collection Services for the County Executive Office's Revenue Services Division in the maximum amount of $1,000,000. $350,000 for a three-year period of January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2026. A little background on the, on the item. The Revenue Services Division has participated in this program since 1996 to supplement their collection program and efforts to collect unpaid delinquent court-ordered fines, fees, and penalties. The current agreement expires at the end of this month, so under the Proposed agreement: The county will pay an administrative uh, will pay an administrative fee in the maximum amount of 15% of the amount collected. This maximum percentage rate is set in accordance with the California Revenue and Tax Code Section 19282. Revenue Services estimates and the collection fees will not exceed the $1,350,000 for the three-year renewal term. 
the proposed agreement is on file with the clerk of the board. So with that, I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions or comments from Mr. Bramer? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? Already, then the chair will entertain a motion. I'll second. A motion by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Thank you, the item is moved. All right, thank you. Now we'll move to item nine, Public Works Highway 49 Wastewater Capacity Improvement Project. This is a professional services agreement with Stantec Inc. Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board, council, and CEO. Robin Mahoney, program manager with Department of Public Works. Uh, this item is part of a larger effort to address a timely wastewater capacity issue in Sewer Maintenance District 1, or SMD 1, in North Auburn. The existing Highway 49 wastewater gravity trunk line was constructed in 1960 as part of the formation of SMD-1. The segment of pipeline does not have the capacity to accommodate sewer flows associated with current approved, current approved and planned growth in SMD-1, including areas identified for low-income housing. Staff applied for and received a $500,000 grant from the local Early Action Planning Grants Program through Department of Housing and Community Development towards an alternatives analysis and design of a selected project to increase the capacity of the trunk line. This increased capacity will support existing and future flows with build out anticipated by the Placer County General Plan. The overall design costs approximately $1 million and SMD1 capacity reserves funded approximately half of this cost. Staff adhered to the procurement process for solicitation of the work and the Board of Supervisors executed an agreement in 2021 with Stantec Consulting Services. The design was completed and approved by your board on November 27th, 2023. The proposed project includes a retrofit solution, retrofit solution to divert flows from the existing gravity system to address existing and build out flow limitations. The project would accomplish this by extending the existing Auburn Ravine sewer force main from its current terminus on Highway 49 near Edgewood Road to the SMD-1 regional pump, sta pump station on Jerger Road. An initial study mitigated negative declaration, or ISMND, was determined as the appropriate document for the proposed project to comply with the California Environmental Quality Act. The ISMND was prepared and was adopted by your board on November 27th, 2023. The total project cost is currently estimated at approximately $20 million. Due to funding constraints, the project will be constructed in phases. Phase one of the project is proposed for construction first and comprised of the downstream section of pipeline. Uh, this section is approximately from Quartz Drive near Highway 49 and the regional pump station on Jerger Road. Staff anticipate bidding construction of phase one of the project and returning to your board to award the resulting construction contract in the spring of next year. Staff are concurrently, in, are concurrently in the process of soliciting a request for proposals for construction management services for phase one of the project. County staff consulted with procurement services regarding the use of Stantec for engineering services for bidding and construction of phase one of the project due to Stantec's experience with the project through the recent work with the design. Stantec specializes in this, in this line of work, and staff believe a solicitation process would not yield a better result. Procurement Policy Section 3.5e allows for an exception to the competitive solicitation process if the purchasing agent determines that competitive proposals would not produce an advantage. The requested award recommendation meets this criterion. The total agreement amount of $223,931 exceeds the Director of Public Works Authority and requires your board's approval. Uh, essentially, we're selecting Stantec uh, for this work because of their uh, intimate experience with the design of this project, and we would like to be able to use them for um, answering any questions we may not be able to answer in-house during the bidding process. Uh, that may come in during during the bidding process, as well as uh, any issues that come up during construction. 
and that's what this contract is for. So today, staff is requesting from uh, the following actions from your board. Number one, authorize the Director of Public Works or designee to execute an agreement not to exceed $223,931 with Stantec Consulting Services, Inc. to provide engineering services for bidding and construction of Phase 1 of the Highway 49 Wastewater Capacity Improvement Project, PJ02412, subject to County Council and Risk Management Concurrence. Number two, approve fiscal year 2023-24 budget amendment AM918 or CC12086 in the amount of $223,931. Number three, approve fiscal year 2023-24 budget amendment AM920 or CC12012 in the amount of $223,931 and cancel Sewer Maintenance District 1 Fund Reserves, FD21000 OT991012, in the amount of $223,931. And finally, number four, determine the proposed actions are consistent with the mitigated negative declaration for the Highway 49 Wastewater Capacity Improvement Project adopted by the Board of Supervisors on November 27th, 2023. And I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? <clears throat> Is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Caller, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, great presentation. Um, my <clears throat> Cheryl Berkman, my concern again is that um, SMD2, I live in Granite Bay, has been in need of service for quite some time. And what we're doing now is um, funding a project potentially for new residents, new development, rather than pay for existing needs of existing residents. It's, it was like 10 years ago that we mentioned SMD2 um, uh, Public Works gave a presentation. It's in dire need, yet we keep funding new projects. Um, and also, I think it's appropriate to understand um, the presentation said that it would, it would not meet current and future growth. And I think understanding what that future growth is, um, because it ties into the RHNA um, rezone project, if that growth were not there, then, um, or what are the numbers that the um, SMD1 will uh, accommodate? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? No, Chairman. Robert, this is being funded out of uh, Sewer Maintenance District 1 reserves. Is that correct? Um, well, this is uh, funded by multiple sources. There's a uh, phase one is funded uh, with $4 million from ARPA dollars, uh, $3.76 million from SACOG uh, grant funding, and approximately $500,000 from Sewer Maintenance District number one capacity reserves. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments from uh, board members? Oh, I'm just ready uh, to make a motion to approve. Uh, is this a roll call vote? Yes, it is. Okay, motion to approve. Okay. Is there a, okay, motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. Will the clerk please call the roll? Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Holmes? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for your time. Happy holidays. Now we'll move to item 10. This is facilities management. Disposition, Salmon Avenue, Salmon Avenue Parking Lot, Kings Beach Property Transfer Agreement. Mr. Chair, um, yes, this please. is Cindy. I need to recuse on this one. As I've previously announced, my husband does work civil engineering for this site and this developer. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Eric Finley, Real Estate Services Manage, uh, Manager, Department of Facilities Management, and I'm here today to request your board's approval of a property transfer agreement for the Salmon Avenue parking lot in Kings Beach. Um, background, the Salmon Avenue parking lot is an outdoor three, uh, 0 0.29 acre public parking lot off of Salmon Avenue. It is managed by the Department of Public Works. This parking lot was created as one of several 
uh, mitigation parking lots for the uh, Kings Beach Corridor Improvement Project, and it has 22 public parking spaces. So there's the location on the PowerPoint, Salmon Avenue parking lot. Directly adjacent to it is the county-owned 3.5-acre Kings Beach Center, which the county is currently under contract to sell the Kings Beach Center to KB Kings Beach LLC, the buyer of the Kings Beach Center. The buyer has proposed um, an agreement to transfer, or the county and the, the buyer have negotiated an agreement to transfer uh, the property to be incorporated into the Kings Beach Center project. In consideration of this transfer, the county will receive um, the 22 outdoor public parking spaces currently in the Salmon Avenue parking lot will be incorporated into a covered parking garage to be constructed at the Kings Beach Center project. So the existing public parking that is currently outdoors will be moved indoors to a public parking garage. In addition, approximately 82, uh, 8,276 square feet of right-of-way along Salmon Avenue will be dedicated to the county. And then um, the buyer will, be, um, will construct additional street parking along Salmon Avenue as may be required in the Kings Beach Center project conditions of project approval. So we're not sure what parking would be required at this time, but the buyer will agree to construct whatever parking on Salmon Avenue street parking that may be required as a condition of project approval. So this just shows the parcel, the Salmon Avenue parking lot, um, the 16 parcels of the Kings Beach Center, and the right-of-way that would be dedicated to the county. This is a potential parking uh, garage site plan. So the Salmon Avenue parking lot is at the very top, uh, uh, right above the word Salmon Avenue. The proposed parking garage would be directly ad adjacent across the street. And the 22 parking spaces that are currently in the Salmon Avenue parking lot would be moved to the areas shown in yellow highlight there. Uh, that would be the public parking spaces. And it's important to note that the Salmon Avenue parking lot will not be removed until the garage is constructed and the public parking is transferred and it's approved by the county. So that public parking at Salmon Avenue is going to remain until there is a um, parking in the garage. And additionally, there will be a deed restriction or covenant on the property that has the garage to ensure that public parking is continued in perpetuity. So with that, the, a the action requested specifically is for your board to adopt a resolution approving the disposition of the Salmon Avenue parking lot parcel located at 8671 Salmon Avenue, Kings Beach, California, APN 090-126-020-0001 to KB Kings Beach LLC and authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to uh, execute and administer the property transfer agreement subject to County Council and Risk Management concurrence and to determine that the uh, requested action is not a project pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act CEQA guidelines 15378. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And Phil Maynard of uh, Kings Barn, the buyer, is also here to answer any questions your board might have. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Just a quick question. So. If for some strange reason this project did not move forward, the Kings Beach or the KB Kings Beach project on the other side of Sam Avenue did not take place, um, then that property um, currently that is the parking lot would go back to the county? Right. There's a provision in the agreement. So um, if escrow closed and they became the owner of the property, the buyer did, but that the garage was not developed or the in the future, then there's a provision that the property be returned to the county in the condition that it was given. In other words, the parking lot needs to be there, not be damaged, and continue as a public parking lot. So it'll only be removed once the garage is built and the public parking is in that garage. So we're building it and making sure that those 
parking spots stay in that area, mm. whether Correct. we have new ones or if those, those don't happen, we would keep having the ones we Correct. have currently. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Jones. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just curious then. So the parking lot will be converted into parking spaces within the parking structure. Correct. The, is the it, is parking it in the parking lot will be moved into the garage on the other side of Salmon Avenue. Okay. And then the Salmon Avenue parking lot will be incorporated into the project design uh, that will not be parking. Okay, but it'll be a one for one. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the, the 22 spaces in the current public parking lot are going to be in the garage, as you see in yellow there, okay. including one. Will ADA that be into perpetuity? In perpetuity, okay. yes. Okay. And that'll be that covenant or deed restriction that the county will uh, work on with the buyer and, and, and be brought before your board for approval to make sure that it is in perpetuity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Is there anyone online? I see none, Chairman. All righty, thank you. Then I'll bring it back to the board for action. I'll move approval of the item. I'll second. It's been, a, there's a motion by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions, not hearing any. We will now move to, uh, on the supplemental general. Uh, what? What's going on? Oh, good. We will now move to the uh, supplemental agenda item 10B. This is Facilities Management Health and Human Services Center Change Order Authorization. Genevieve. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> it is afternoon now. Um, my name is Genevieve Vargas. I am your Capital Improvements Manager, and I am here today uh, to ask for the following actions. Um, to authorize the Director of Facilities Management or designee to execute a change order, uh, change order number five to the construction contract with Turner Construction for um, the Health and Human Services Center project in the amount of $1,406,600. $84 uh, to address unforeseen conditions and construction schedule impacts, resulting in a new potential total construction contract amount of $83,366,381, including existing change order authority for $210,000. Determine, and to determine the requested action is consistent with the final EIR uh, report for the PCGC master plan update project, which covered the Health and Human Services project. Um, on May 11th, uh, 2021, the board authorized execution of a contract with Turner Construction for the new Health and Human Services Center located at the Placer County Government Center. Um, the project broke ground in spring of 2022 and is slated for completion uh, January 18th of 2024, so next month. Um, the original completion date was October of this year. Turner's original awarded construction contract amount was $79,789,777. And uh, approved change orders to date have included change order number one, which was a, a wording contract change, change order number two, uh, was in the amount of $473,338 for unforeseen conditions and was mostly um, to replace the failing existing sewer lines. Change order number three was in the amount of $486,582 to address utility relocation issues and shift the utility construction scope uh, to Turner's contract. Change order number four was to increase the overall, uh, the owner's controlled contingency by $1 million, $1 million, and those funds have been executed uh, from the contingency for addressing unforeseen groundwater issues across the site. Um, today's request is change order number five is for uh, $1,406,684 and would result in an increased base construction contract amount of 81 or 83,000, 83 million, oh my goodness, sorry, <laughs> $156,381. The request is due to multiple factors and the accumulation of impacts and changes over the course of construction and are now being accounted for at the conclusion of the project. Um, so some of the 
impacts that we've seen so far. Early uh, site and building construction was impacted by record rainfall levels. Um, in early 2023, we had about 140% of the average rain. This exceeded the anticipated uh, rain delays that were in the schedule. And then we also had impacts from heavy smoke, local wildfires, and extreme summer heat. Another set of impacts to the project were with the Tier 1 infrastructure project being critical for providing the new underground utilities to the project, progressing at the same time, impacts from the schedule issues and out of sequence con construction activities around the site have extended the project's completion date. Due to the needed changes during the design development of Tier 1, jurisdictional approvals were lengthy, which affected the construction start and the overall schedule. Um, at this time, I am happy to say we do have power, we do have water, so everything is moving well in that department now. Uh, we've also seen some impacts related to uh, with PG&E and their design that took longer than anticipated. We did work really hard and closely with PG&E and were able to finally get power. Um, it was just later than we had originally planned in the schedule. And Turner is requesting a completion schedule extension and the appropriate portion of the extended staffing related costs to the schedule impact. Some in impacts have been recaptured by using overtime, rescheduling and resequencing activities. Uh, the impacts that could not be mitigated are being requested to Turner to extend the substantial completion date by 77 days to January 18th, 2024. This action does not change the previously approved change order authority in an amount not to exceed 210,000 consistent with the public contract code. The PCGC master plan update project, which covered HHS center project prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act was certified by the board and the mitigation monitoring report program supported by and incorporated by reference in its entirety, the findings of fact and statements of overriding considerations was adopted by the board. The actions before you today are consistent with the final EIR and the related approvals. The total cost to the Turner contract, including change order number five, is $83,156,381, plus the potential previously approved change order authority for $210,000 for a potential total contract amount of $83,366,381. Finding the contract, funding the contract included change order number five is available in the fiscal 23-24 budget. There is no additional impact to the general fund as change order number five will be fully funded out of the construction contingency portion of the project budget. And the estimated total project cost of 90,480,000 remains the same. And I just wanted to mention, I have Chris Smart here with me from Turner Construction. Um, you know, we're wrapping up the project here. It's coming to completion. And this will probably be the last time we're to the board with the project. So I did want to have him here in case you had any questions for him or um, if there was anything further that you needed from me. Uh, and I did want to mention that the total change orders on the project right now is at 4.2%, which is way below industry standard. So we're coming in at a really good spot with the money and we're excited for the project to complete. So with that, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Genevieve. Any comments, questions from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Hi, Mike Garabedi in Placer County tomorrow. Just want to note for the record that this included a reference to the Placer County Conservation Plan. Thank you. No other commenters. No, no one else? Okay. Uh, so there's no public comment, uh, and public comment is over. Uh, I think it's time for us to make a motion. Is this a uh, no? All right. So if someone wants to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion. But first, I did want to thank um, the incredible efforts in delivering this project through a really challenging time. Um, it looks amazing. And I think the efforts that have gone in and the small amount of change orders really outstanding and so i just want to commend staff and turner for a great partnership on this project so thank you just because we're worn out and haven't had lunch yet don't take <laughs> that as uh you know that we don't appreciate the hard yeah, work that absolutely. it takes to deliver something of this magnitude so really um very thankful for it 
I appreciate that. It has been a great relationship working with Turner. And yeah, um, yeah it's, I'm, I'm very excited to see the project come to a completion. Absolutely. So I'll be happy to move approval. I will second. Okay, motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Landon. Uh, first of all, um, I drive by there at least twice a day and just watching it slowly, slowly evolve. It's, it's amazing. It seems like we're never going to get there, but we're very, very close. So I'm yeah, so we're very thankful. close, yes. I'm so thankful. I can't wait for uh, the uh, Health and Human Service to be able to move into that. It'll be phased, and I know it's going to be, that's going to be a challenge in itself. But really, really looking forward to that. So thank you for uh, your, all your work on this. <clears throat> and with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 11. County Executive approval of funding and authorization for agreements for six projects in the TOT sponsorship. Hey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman uh, Holmes, members of the board, Daniel Karen, uh, Stephanie Holloway, your deputy CEO. Uh, up in the Tahoe area. I'm here um, standing between you and lunch, so I will be very brief. This is a follow-up item um, from the October 16th board item in Tahoe with a number of contracts, uh, use of funds agreements that we would like to bring forward for your approval. So, um, but before I get started, I, I just wanna take a minute to recognize um, you know, the, the very quick turnaround of these use of funds agreements and the agreements with the uh, with the Department of Public Works. Uh, Lindsay Romack um, in my office and um, Rob Sandman in County Council just did an amazing job of working with applicants uh, and our departments to get these ready for you in a very short period of time. Um, so kudos to them. I do want to also introduce you to a new staff uh, in my office. Audrey Vaughn uh, joined us you? about three weeks. I think she, are you on your third week? Um, she is our new staff services analyst, and so she will be working very closely with Rob in the future um, on these agreements and these contracts, um, really um, working then with NTCA on tracking, um, you know, providing us with metrics of efficiencies and, um, and, and the sort. So uh, thank you, Audrey, for joining me down here in Auburn today, uh, and I'll get started. So like I said, follow-up item from the October board uh, up in Tahoe where you gave direction uh, to the CEO office to uh, start working uh, forward on use of funds agreements for uh, TOT uh, on 13 projects. Uh, so these 13 projects, as you will recall, were recommended uh, by NTCA, their board of directors, uh, and, and the number of committees that they manage um, on your, uh, as a part of your advisory network. So um, that uh, network uh, has come together um, to sort of brand as community vitality and economic health. Um, so a number of projects, 13 of them, uh, totaling $14 million, just north of $14 million of recommended TOT investment in the region over the next three years. Uh, I will also mention that the NTCA Board of Directors did also approve $2.5 million of TBID, uh, Tourism Business Improvement District dollars, um, to a number of uh, projects through that investment program as well in the fall. So. Uh, lots of work going forward. They're working on separate agreements as part of their TBID uh, mission. So, uh, like I said, since, since that board date, we have been working diligently with applicants. We have six agreements uh, for you to consider uh, today. Uh, there are seven remaining that we are continuing to work forward on, and we'll bring them forward when they are ready. So, uh, three of these, uh, three of these uh, use of funds agreements are with outside entities, and therefore... Um, they are uh, before you today and being requested for approval. Uh, they are the Tahoe City Public Utility District Trail Reconstruction Project, uh, North Tahoe Public Utility District, Pam Emmerich Pine Drop Trail Reconstruction and Extension Project, uh, and then a, a, an agreement, use of funds agreement with Sierra Community House on Workforce Housing uh, Direct Assistance Program. So three of those with outside agencies uh, use of funds agreements. There are also three um, with our Department of Public Works. Um, we are um, asking that you approve an interdepartmental memo with the Department of Pro Public Works for uh, the North Tahoe Trail Segment 1, uh, the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan, uh, State Route 89 and 267, their corridor management uh, and transit priority, 
uh, work that they're doing in the region, and then also the Kings Beach Western Approach Project. Uh, all three of those projects uh, advised by your board to move forward. So we have an um, uh, an, um, interdepartment memo for you to consider. Uh, I will mention, just as an aside, that three trails projects, uh, part of the conversation in October was whether to fund uh, the three-year ask or the one-year ask. Um, and so we are moving forward at your direction to just fund this year, but we are continuing to work, um, as we talked about back in October, uh, on a study to really dive in and look at uh, how we fund trails into the future. So we are, at CEO's office is working forward on that. So. Uh, as far as the budget, uh, the, uh, the fiscal impact for this year's budget, $2,712,375. It is currently budgeted in our um, Tahoe Economic and Community Enhancement Fund uh, supported with TOT. Uh, so the remaining costs as part of uh, the three-year program will be uh, considered by your board as part of future year budgets. Um, so with that, I will read uh, the action requested here. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, we asking your board to approve two million two hundred and twelve thousand three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars or million dollars in uh, TOT funding uh, for three projects. Like I mentioned, uh, the Tahoe City Public Utility District uh, Trail Reconstruction Project, uh, the North Tahoe Public Utility. District Pam Emmerich Memorial Pine Drop Trail Reconstruction and Extension Project and the Sierra Community House Workforce Housing uh, Direct Assistance Program and to authorize the County Executive Officer or designee to execute use of funds agreements upon County Council and risk management approval. So that is the action one. Uh, action two is to approve $2,081,000 in TOT uh, funding and interdepartment memos with three uh, Placer County led projects um, the North Tahoe uh, Trail Segment 1, the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan, uh, State Route 89, and State Route 267 cord, uh, Adaptive Corridor Management Transit Priority Project, and then also the Kings Beach Western Approach Project upon, upon County Council and Risk Management Approval, and then the third action. Uh, determine that the requested actions are not projects under the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines 15378. All With right. That, happy answering your questions. All right. Uh, any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience that wants to address this item? Is there anyone online? Yes, Chairman. Caller, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Mr. Garabedian, can you unmute your mic to give your comments? Mr. Garabedian? Chairman, this is, uh, unfortunately, he can't unmute his mic. This issue's not on our end. All right. Oh, okay. there he goes. He just unmuted. No, we, oh, we he, he disconnected. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the three actions as requested. Second. Motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Gore. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, no worries. All right. Nice meeting you. And now we will adjourn to closed session, and I will have County Council report. Uh, uh, report what, what? Yeah. The board will now adjourn to closed session to consider two items of existing litigation. All right. Be back.
Are we ready? All righty. <clears throat> the board has just returned from closed session. County Council will report out. The board met in closed session to consider the following under existing litigation Friends of the West Shore versus County of Placer. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5 0 vote. The second matter of Placer County Sheriff's Office versus Kevin Joseph Murphy. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5 0 vote. That concludes the report out of closed session. All righty, before we close, uh, is there any public comment uh, that wasn't able to be heard during our morning session? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>